Good afternoon, everyone, for joining us for today's conference on changing geopolitics and the future of U.S. Rock Alliance, hosted by the Korea Studies here at School of International School of Advanced and International Studies, SAIS Johns Hopkins. My name is Mia No. I'm the director of uh, and senior fac faculty lead of the Korea Studies. Um, and I'm really delighted to be back to my alma mater um, as a full-time faculty to run its Korea program. I believe that today's conference topic, changing geopolitics and it, its implications uh, for the U.S. Rock Alliance is very timely. The global geopolitical and economic uh, landscape is rapidly reshaping with the enduring U.S.-China tensions, Russia's Ukraine invasion, not to mention the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. While Western democracies um, under the U.S. leadership have mobilized to support uh, Ukraine and sanction Russia, world energy and food markets are dealing with major disturbances as a result of sanctions and warfare. The fallout reaches all the way to East Asia, and South Korea is having trade deficit for, six, for the six consecutive months um, this year, mostly due to the higher energy prices. The intensifying U.S.-China tensions might even get worsened. Uh, we know that the U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi visited Taiwan recently, and some experts worry that the two countries could begin hurling toward a diplomatic, economic, and an even military crisis. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un um, has declared itself a nuclear weapon state on September 9, and on Tuesday, North Korea fired an intermediate-range ballistic missile that flew over Japan and launched two more short-range ballistic missiles last night um, and marking 24 times of conducting missile tests just this year. So with this ext extraordinary challenging set of circumstances, how is East Asia and Indo-Pacific region security and economic architecture changing? How has um, the U.S. Rock Alliance evolved with this changing landscape and how should the future of the alliance look like? We're very lucky to have uh, our distinguished speakers today who have extraordinary career, knowledge, wisdom, and insights about this set of pressing issues. I'd like to express my deepest appreciation for the Korean speakers who came all the way across the Pacific to participate in today's conference. I'm also very grateful for American speakers who will join us today. Special thanks to Ambassador Kathy Stevens um, for her time to moderate our first, pa first panel, Rethinking Regional Order in East Asia, Implication for the U.S. ROC Alliance, who will start shortly. The second panel, Resilient Global Supply Chain, um, the, the approaches to establish resilient supply chains, will take place at 2.25 p.m. after a brief break. So I hope you stay till the end, as we also have a great group of speakers. I also like to thank the East Asia Foundation for co-hosting today's event. I'd like to welcome Chairman um, Kim Sung Hwan of the foundation, who is also former Minister of Foreign Affairs and Trade of the Republic of Korea, to the stage for his welcome remarks. This is a public conference, um, um, open to the public. It won't be live streamed, but then the YouTube will be on the website later. Um, and I'd like to welcome, the, again, the member of SITES community, student faculty, as well as guests from outside. Thank you so much again. And Minister, now the stage is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm very pleased to have the conference on changing geopolitics and the future of Korea-U.S. alliance with the School of Advanced International Studies of Johns Hopkins University. On behalf of East Asia Foundation, I sincerely welcome all of you and wish to express my deep gratitude to everyone who joined us today. Uh, as already uh, Dr. O mentioned, we have two sessions. In the first session, scholars of both countries will make an assessment of impact of the regional order in East Asia on the current U.S.-Korea alliance. Uh, taking this opportunity, I would like to express my thanks to panelists of the first session, Dr. Charles Doran, uh, Professor of International Relations and Director of Canadian Studies of Johns Hopkins University, and Mr. Scott Snyder, Senior Fellow for Korea Studies and Director of the program, 
on U.S. Korea policy at the Council on Foreign Relations. And Dr. Park Chul Hee, uh, he is a professor and director of Institute of International Studies at the Seoul National University. And Dr. Jung Yun Moon, uh, distinguished professor at the Yonsei University and the chairman of Sejong Institute. And in the second session, former policymakers and experts of both countries will discuss the future of U.S.-Korea cooperation on economic relations focusing on technology and innovation. I also would like to express my thanks to four panelists of the second session, uh, Mr. Kevin Ulf, former Assistant Secretary of Commerce and the partner at the Aiking Gump Strauss Hauer and the Felp LLP, and Mr. Matt Goodman, Senior Vice President for Economics at the CSIS, and Dr. Chung Yong An, Distinguished Professor at the Graduate School of International Studies at the Chungang University and the co-chair of the Korea-India Strategic Dialogue. And Ambassador Myung-hee Liu, former trade minister of Korea and the visiting professor at the Graduate School of International Studies at the Seoul National University. Lastly, but not the least, I would like to thank my longtime friend, Ambassador Kathleen Stevens, former US ambassador to Korea and the president and the CEO of Korea Economic Institute of America for moderating the first session. And I wish to express my special thanks to Dr. Oh Mi Yeon, who uh, made tremendous efforts to organize this wonderful conference and the moderating the second session. So distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, now uh, we are living in an age of uncertainty and the geopolitical situation of the world has become more complicated already as Dr. O mentioned. There are COVID-19 pandemic intensifying US-China strategic competition and Russia's invasion in Ukraine, which have brought about supply chain disruption, energy crisis, food shortage, rampant inflation, and the fear of global recession. Furthermore, likelihood of a nuclear war is higher than ever. Since the onset of its unlawful invasion of Ukraine, Russia is threatening to use nuclear weapons against any outside attempt to intervene in the war. And North Korea just adopted a new law authorizing an automatic use of preemptive nuclear strikes to protect itself. In the face of this changing geopolitical landscape and the growing North Korean threats, new government of Korea opted to preserve its national interests through strengthening the alliance with the United States. U.S. President Biden made his first visit to Korea 11 days after President Yoon's inauguration in May. And since then, for the last five months, two presidents had two more meetings and top leaders of the U.S. government <clears throat> and Congress, including Vice President Harris and the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, visited Korea. I believe such frequent meetings between the top leaders of both countries symbolically show us how closely two governments are working together to expand and deepen our comprehensive strategic alliance. Now let me highlight two points of a joint statement of the first summit between the two presidents. First, strengthen the deterrence to North Korean nuclear threats. President Biden affirmed the U.S. extended deterrence commitment to Korea using the full range of U.S. defense capabilities, including nuclear, conventional, and missile defense capabilities. President Biden also reaffirmed the U.S. commitment to deploy strategic U.S. military assets in a timely and coordinated manner as necessary. In accordance with agreement between the two presidents, extended deterrence strategy and the consultation group meeting was reactivated three weeks ago here in Washington, D.C. in nearly five years. While strengthening deterrences, two presidents emphasized that the dialogue remains open for diplomatic solution of a North Korean nuclear issue. Uh, through his Liberation Day speech, President Yoon unveiled his audacious economic assistance plan to North Korea if North Korea takes steps toward denuclearization. 
However, it is disappointing to see that North Korean leader stressed North Korea would never give up nuclear weapons and heightened tensions on the Korean Peninsula by staging military provocation with a series of missile launch. The second point is strategic, economic, and technology partnership between the two countries. Two presidents pledged to deepen and broaden cooperation on critical and emerging technologies, including semiconductors, batteries, artificial intelligence, and quantum technologies. They also agree to address the challenges in the supply chain ecosystem and establish a regular ministerial level supply chain and commercial dialogue. Two presidents committed to closely cooperate through the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, so-called IPEF, initiated by the US and launched in May. Korean government is now actively participating in the meetings of IPF and announced that it would join preliminary meeting for CHIP4. The fact that first place President Biden visited in Korea was not a military base in US military base in Korea, but by Samsung Semiconductor Complex in Pyeongtaek, displayed that the line between economic and national security has blurred and technology has become integral part of national security. Now, before I conclude my remarks, let me take a few moments to introduce East Asia Foundation. East Asia Foundation was founded in 2005 with a generous funding from Hyundai Motor Company with a view to broaden knowledge networks. We have maintained exchange with the numerous institutions and universities in the United States, Japan, and China. We also publish a quarterly English journal, Global Asia, which is available at the outside uh, table. Uh, once again, I wish to thank you, all of you, for participating in the today's conference, and particularly those who laboriously prepared today's meeting. Thank you. <laughs> and now I will give the floor to Ambassador Stevens. The uh, floor is yours. That's fine. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's, uh, I like the informality that comes when you don't have events for a while, in-person events, and uh, I, I, it feels very special to be here uh, with all of you uh, at this lovely event uh, hosted by SAIS Johns Hopkins uh, and the East Asia Foundation on such a beautiful day. I want to, first of all, also add my welcome to our Korean delegation who arrived here. Uh, we have you to thank, I've decided, for this wonderful autumn weather that we just started enjoying today. Truly a Chungo Mabi day. <laughs> and um, uh, we thank you for that. We hope you'll enjoy your stay here. It is really, really wonderful to see you here after so long. And I have to say a special welcome, if I may, to uh, uh, Minister Kim Song Hwan as well. Uh, thank you for your remarks. I think you've set this up very well. Uh, Minister Kim was uh, the, uh, the National Security Advisor and, uh, and, and Foreign Minister uh, during the time when I managed to hold only one job, which is ambassador to uh, Korea, and I'll, I'll never uh, forget and always uh, appreciate uh, the kind of partnership that he extended to me and to our embassy and what he did for, to strengthen the U.S.-Korea relationship. Um, I'm supposed to be the moderator, so I shouldn't be talking too long, and I think uh, the substance, uh, again, Minister Kim has set up very well, but since I'm a moderator, I have to say, coming back to this room again and seeing it, I have to say, since we're recording it, it'll be uh, uh, on video where we've watched so many things over the last few years, and we're grateful for that. So grateful to see some familiar faces <laughs> from a few years ago, uh, and some new faces uh, from here at SAIS, uh, which has done so much over the years at for uh, U.S.-Korean relations. Um, so my, I, I remember coming here when I was working at the State Department, even before I went to Korea's ambassador, it was about 2005, 2006, and there was a program in this very room, I remember, and uh, outside there was, uh, 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 what, what the substance of the program doesn't really matter, because what I remember is outside there were a couple of dogs called sapsalge, which are like traditional Korean dogs, and I, and I learned the history of these dogs, and I was so impressed with them that one of the first things I did when I got to Korea's ambassador is I went out and I got two sapsalge. So that's a way to say that, that coming to events like this can have unexpected <laughs> uh, repercussions and consequences. In this case, it was wonderful, and uh, one of my Sapsal gays still lives south of Seoul in, in retirement. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so with that, uh, I, uh, I uh, also appreciate uh, Dr. Omi Hyun, the way that she's uh, uh, structured uh, this seminar this afternoon. Uh, the title of uh, what we're going to talk about for the next uh, hour or so is 
make sure I get it right. Um, the chain, uh, rethinking the regional order in East Asia uh, and its implications for the U.S. ROK alliance. Uh, I think we have a terrific and very, if I may say, diverse panel here to talk about that. Uh, I want to say, as someone who's guilty of this myself, I don't want to just dive right into talking about all the, all the things about the U.S.-Korea alliance. Clearly, we're going to focus on that. But there is a lot of rethinking going on, or at least there needs to be. But it doesn't mean that we're all thinking the same way. And this is, again, where I think we need to get a kind of a diverse uh, sort of set of ideas out there that reflect different geographical as well as strategic perspectives, and then try to have a very lively conversation about it. I will say, in terms of architecture for, for panels like this, I am not a believer in the hub-and-spoke system. I don't believe that it all has to come like this, uh, and that I hope after each of our panelists give opening remarks uh, that we can have a lively back and forth, and we will certainly try to save 10 or 15 minutes uh, for some comments and questions from the floor. So with that, uh, I'm going to just uh, second what Dr. Kim said in terms of uh, the, the, the shaping of the issues that we're about to discuss, and uh, also just uh, in the order of, of, of their speaking, and you've already uh, seen their names and heard their names, our four very distinguished panelists are Dr. Charles F. Duran. I'm saying your surname correctly, is that right? Sounds good to me. <laughs> that means no. <laughs> See, I don't have to say that for the, the, the Korean names. I know that. Um, uh, the Andrew W. Mellon, uh, Professor of International Relations, the Director of Global Theory and History Program, and the Director of Canadian Studies here at John Hopkins SAIS, and I also know the mentor of some of the most brilliant uh, uh, scholars uh, in, in, in my field uh, that I know. So welcome to you. Uh, we also have, of course, Dr. Moon Jung-in, the chairman of the Sejong Institute, uh, Professor Emeritus at Yonsei University, uh, and so great to see you uh, back in the U.S. again. Uh, Dr. Chori Park, or Park Chori, the professor and director, of, uh, at, professor at Seoul National University and director of the Institute of International Studies there. He's also been the dean of the Graduate School of International Affairs and the director of Japanese studies. So I told him he has the trifecta now at SNU. And uh, I'm looking forward to, in particular, some of his remarks on the kind of Japan angle, if you like, or the rethinking from the Japanese angle in Japan, Korea, as well as his broader analysis. And finally, but not least, uh, Scott Snyder, uh, right here in Washington, DC, the senior fellow for Korean studies and the director of the program in US-Korea policy at the Council on Foreign Relations, and the author of some of the most insightful books and essays that I refer to often on the U.S.-Korea relationship. So with that, uh, Dr. Duran, I'm going to turn to you first. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it uh, is a delight and an honor to uh, be here uh, with so many friends and, and so many uh, students. Um, I uh, would like to start my comments by saying that I have given a little subtitle to mine, uh, my talk, and that is uh, Building Security in East Asia. That's the little, the little uh, positive uh, twist that I've uh, presented here. Now, two recent events help focus the mind on problems in East Asia. First is the matter of the recent encirclement of Taiwan by warships from China, hinting perhaps at both, in, uh, it, both its future capacity and intention to enforce an embargo there on trade and external contact. This encirclement was combined as well with missile flyovers. Second is the issue of North Korea's recent missile flyover of Japan. The purpose of this North Korean missile flyover can only be interpreted as an attempt to intimidate Japan. China and its North Korean junior partner are trying to assert expanded influence in the region. But the purpose of this egregious foreign policy, these uh, uh, egregious foreign policy actions is um, also, in my judgment, to try to isolate South Korea. China and North Korea do not want South Korea 
to join the Quad. They are using these foreign policy bullying tactics to telegraph this message to South, excuse me, to South Korea. Both China and North Korea ignore in another way, it seems to me, the serious potential that these infringements on the sovereignty of Japan and South Korea generate. These infringements create abrupt and massively increased incentive on the part of the threatened states for enhanced nuclear acquisition. The missile flyovers are symbolic of the efforts of China and North Korea to try to dominate the region militarily and to constrain naval and air transport. South Korea faces a dilemma. Should it remain outside this increasingly powerful alliance uh, among the United States, Japan, Australia, and India, thus possibly risking the lack of support in time of need from some of these states? Or should South Korea risk irritating China by joining the alliance in order to enjoy improved security? Meanwhile, some voices in the region argue that North Korea, with its new missiles capable of reaching the territory of the United States, may lessen American support for South Korea. But if North Korea could actually penetrate American anti-missile defenses, which I doubt, and if its missile cap capability were accurate enough to strike an intended target a few thousand miles away, which is unlikely, surely all North Korea will have achieved is to make itself a much more focused target for a devastating American counter-strike. And for this reason, of deterrence, North Korea will not send a missile carrying a nuclear warhead into American territory. It is a frightening experience to face hostile advances by militarily powerful neighbors alone. Asia, via the Quad, is finally indicating its willingness and capacity collectively to stand up to China and to North Korea. South Korea, seeing its interest clearly and realistically, and despite the complexity of its negotiations with Japan, should smooth its own path to a more secure future by joining the members of the Quad. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, great overview, and Korea should join the Quad. <laughs> so, is, uh, uh, I'm sure we'll get to that and, and the other issues you raised, which we appreciate. Thanks for that. Uh, Dr. Moon. Okay, I will sit here. You know. It's fine. Because you know, Professor Charles Doran, who was an advisor of our former foreign minister, Yoon Young Wan, and therefore, you know, even Dr. Omian is also in you know, his student too. Therefore, now you can see you know, Dr. Mm -hmm. Charles Doran's contribution to South Korea. Let us give a big applause to him <laughs> for his contribution. <laughs> and I think that, you know, that Professor Doran has given a very good you know, picture. And I'm supposed to give a talk about the changing regional order in East Asia. Order is all about you know, sort of patterned behavior by following a set of rules norms, principles, and procedures. And have there been any big changes? I, don't, I do not see any big changes yet, but obviously regional order in East Asia in, in flux, in, it's in the process of changing. 
that what kind of changes do I see? I see three major changes. First change comes from geopolitical domain, okay? In the past, as you know, Ambassador Stevens pointed out, uh, there was a, you know, hub and spoke alliance system on the one hand. And then the, on the other hand, there was some kinds of so-called multilateral cooperation in the security arena. It is kinds of eclectic regional order, but for stability and mutual cooperation. But that is changing, okay? And obviously, uh, the fierce competition between China and the United States is one factor. Another factor is uh, North Korean factor. Third factor is the Russian invasion of Ukraine have been fostering new geopolitical landscape in East Asia. And we clearly see tendency that uh, China, Russia, North Korea will be cooperating further. On the other hand, as a response to ten move, the, the US, Japan, South Korea will be cooperating uh, more closely. And therefore, then we'll have a new northern you know, triangular block and new southern triangular block then there will be revival of old block politics. And it kind of in the geopolitical polarization, as evidence through the whole this you know, Chinese containment of Taiwan, okay, and also the growing tension in South China Sea and East China Sea, and even you know, very precarious situation on the Korean Peninsula. And all these kinds of point point out that uh, there is a you know change in regional you know, geopolitical order in the direction of some kinds of confrontation. But also in geoeconomic uh, area, we also see changing patterns. And obviously in the past, we used to follow multilateral you know, arrangement, okay? Starting with the GATT, Bretton's Monetary System, later World Trade Organization, and et cetera. But it was degenerating into the regional, sub-regional, bilateral, FTAs, and whatever. But now, things are getting worsened. Okay, now, uh, as uh, Minister Kim pointed out, you know, United States has proposed the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, okay, and also United States proposed in Chip for Alliance, and other kinds of economic arrangement among so-called free world, okay. And the aim said, you know, uh, encircling or containing China. And particularly when we talk about decoupling of supply chain, uh, that really means that uh, there is a new pattern of a regional economic order uh, in the direction of fragmentation and closed regionalism. That in the past, we are following multilateralism and open regionalism. Now, there is a trend toward the closed re regionalism and the fragmentation of you know, international economic norms, principles, rules, and procedures. Uh, there is a you know, worrisome concern about that development. And third is, third landscape is about the value, okay? All of a sudden, liberal world versus illiberal world have been confronting each other, okay? And after the end of Cold War, the value issue has kind of evaporated, okay? Very few talked about values. Even in, American, in the context of American foreign policy, you know, value was important, but there was a moment of, you know, there was a unipolar moment. Therefore, there was an American supremacy, and there was a kind of value shaped by the United States, and et cetera. And also other countries were, China was moving into the direction of opening a reform, Russia, there was an immense domestic political change. There, there was anticipation that we are moving into the, in the same direction as Francis Fukuyama once you know, wrongly you know, predicted. But now we see different kinds of world. Okay? There has been emphasis on unity of free world, liberal world, against illiberal world. And in the wake of you know, Russian invasion of Ukraine, that kinds of value confrontation has become more you know, prominent. Then now we clearly see the three major changes, okay? One in geopolitics, another geoeconomics, third, value dimensions. 
then given these kinds of changes, then what kind of regional order can we uh, anticipate? In my personal opinion, we haven't arrived, we have not arrived at the new Cold War, okay? Cold War is all about ideology, and I don't see any steep ideological confrontation yet, okay? But I would say that the current East Asian regional order is at the crossroad of Cold Peace and New Cold War, but it's very precarious and uncertain. Then what kinds of policies South Korea can choose? South Korea has five options. Obvious one option is taking side with the United States uh, to, by pursuing pro-American balancing strategy. Another possibility is a bandwagon in China. Third possibility is declaring neutrality or possess nuclear weapons and declare a nuclear armed middle power. That's the third option. Fourth option is what? Pursue strategy of murdering through, as our government has been doing in the past. They pursue alliance with the United States on the one hand and maintain strategic cooperative partnership with China on the other hand. But when US-China relations were good, that kind of strategy was possible. But Beijing and Washington engage in stiff competition, the margin for maneuvering that kind of muddling through is, has become much more difficult. Finally, the South Korea can pursue with other middle powers to prevent the conflict between China and the United States and uh, urge international society to return to the, the principles of multilateral cooperation, okay? And which I termed the transcending diplomacy, okay? South Korea alone cannot be done. When, uh, you know, Minister Kim Sung-hwan was the foreign minister, and you know, he initiated so-called METCA, you know, there's a whole middle power states, you know, Mexico, Indonesia, Australia, Turkey, South Korea, they gathered together and tried to set the international agenda. That is kind of what I mean in a trans transcending diplomacy, uh, so that we can prevent the coming collision between China and the United States. Of those five options, the current Yoon song yeol government has been taking the pro-American balancing strategy. And as to detail of uh, President Yoon song yeol government strategy, you know, Professor uh, Park Chali will elaborate. And, but it's a, then his point is very straightforward. You know, as to geopolitics, very simple. We strengthen alliance with the United States. We are more than willing to join Quad, okay? And, and also strengthen trilateral cooperation and coordination among China, uh, the US, Japan, South Korea, okay? And, you know, those are the you know, kind of policy you know, Yoon Song-yeol government has been pursuing. On geoeconomics, yes, we'll join, we'll strengthen economic security you know, alliance with the United States. And therefore, we'll pursue, uh, you know, uh, chip alliance, okay? And also, we'll pursue technologi technological alliance with the United States. And, and, out there, and also, as to geopolitics, we have been, you know, the, the, the Yun Song-yeol government has been uh, uh, calling for close cooperation with NATO. And also, our government has decided to establish the, its representative in Brussels, the NATO headquarter. Those are the you know, elements. And geoeconomics, likewise, we want to pursue more close cooperation with the United States. The value, as President Yun Song-yeol made a, you know, the speech at the United Nations General Assembly. You know, the, our government has been emphasizing the importance of solidarity among free countries. Okay, you know, freedom, solidarity uh, among like-minded countries. Therefore, uh, our government has been going in fine tune with the United States. Then now. What is the problem, what would be the, in the problem with that kind of policy? I see some you know, domestic you know, hindrance 
to the pursuit of that kind of policies. First, a lot of South Koreans are concerned about the revival of new Cold War, in which South Korea would become front line. In the geopolitical point of view, South Korea is you know, bound to be front line because we're the front, most front in the area against China and North Korea. Therefore, if that being the case, then we will be the first victim of new Cold War. Should we want? There is a kind of internal debate in South Korea. And also another you know, great concern is this. Suppose we take a you know, hostile stance against China then China will be strengthening its ties with North Korea. Suppose China provide North Korea with weapons, logistic support, and oil. Then we'll have additional threat coming from North Korea. There were those kinds of you know, practical you know, challenges to us. And as geoeconomics, you know, we will also see the similar kinds of challenges, okay? Uh, you know, China accounts for 25 percent of our, you know, trade, okay, and particularly our export, and our semiconductor firms export about, you know, 60 percent, 60 percent of their goods to China and Hong Kong combined, and more importantly, you know, for example, Samsung's semiconductor import the 60 percent of its uh, materials, raw materials, and some parts and components for the semiconductor from China. Therefore, on the one hand, it is very beneficial for us to pursue chip alliance with the United States or FAT4 you know, ties with the United States. But on the other hand, we have a, you know, such a kinds of you know, constraints you know, coming from China. Then how to balance between the two uh, will become you know, a major challenge for us. And another concern is this. You know, South Korea is a free trading state. And as a liberal trading state, we always want multilateralism okay, and open regionalism. Therefore, if we pursue closed regionalism and fragmented regional order, will it be beneficial to us in the medium to long term? And, and I think that will be another big you know, debate. Uh, to the, that will be another big issue to, for the debate you know, at home. And also, we got to really think about the cost and benefit of in really aligning with the United States for economic gains. You know, what are the uh, concurrent you know, cost resulting from that kind of alignment? The uh, third issue is about value alliance. You know, and the President Yun made it very clear that we'll go for you know, uh, value alliance with the United States and also cooperation and solidarity among like-minded countries. But here again, we are not the United States. U.S. can pursue both value and national interest. Can we pursue both simultaneously? Okay. And at one point, there must be some kinds of you know, compromise. Okay. And given all these kinds of things, and my bet is this, you know, I personally believe that the, the Yoon Song Yeo government is a very pragmatic government. And during the days of president's election campaign, and uh, President Yoon came up with a lot of so-called harsh remarks and whatever. But uh, now he's a very pragmatic person. Therefore, I think he will come up with some kinds of compromise. Therefore, geopolitics, he'll be much more cautious. For example, he prom promised to introduce additional you know, elements of thought, but he's not raising that issue. On the geoeconomic dimension, he has been keep telling uh, Korean audience that uh, uh, we should figure it out what Chinese are thinking about, okay? And that is another good indicator. And also he sent Foreign Minister Park Jin to China, and Park Jin had a meeting with uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi and he explained about the Chip 4 alliance, and he, would tell, he was telling Wang Yi that Chip 4 alliance is not alliance, just, just Chip 4 coordination, particularly fab, fabrication for co you know, coordination and cooperation. But that really shows that the you know, Yun Seung Yeol government trying to come up with a more realistic solution to the problem. But as to value issue, because President Yun is so committed to the issue of freedom, liberty, okay? I don't know to what extent he can make a compromise on that issue. But with regard to geoeconomics and geopolitics, 
he will come up with some kinds of compromise. And therefore, you know, personally, you know, Korea has kind of its existential uh, limitation as a trading state. Trading state always want openness, transparency, cooperation, multilateralism. And I personally believe that the Yoon Song-yeol government would go in that direction too. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Moon. Thank you. Dr. Park, Park Chodi, we'll turn to you. Thank you. Uh, uh, like a professor, I think a Professor Moon is very much designed today. I have a better habit of uh, designing my talk spontaneously after listening to others. <laughs> so uh, I, will, I will comment on, uh, the, uh, on the basis of uh, Professor Doran and the Professor Moon's talk. Uh, but I, I'm very happy to speak after Professor Moon, because if I speak later, she, he will criticize me, but I can criticize you. <laughs> and I'm much more happy that uh, you you're make a judgment that the Yoon Sang-yeol government is a pragmatic government. Uh, I will deliver the message to the Blue House, and then no, I... He's, des des <laughs> he's destined to be pragmatic <laughs> in Korea, you know. We do not have a freedom of being in an ideological <laughs> regime. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'll start from the uh, Professor Doran's uh, uh, mention about the South Korea's dilemma uh, between remaining outside the alliance or risking irritating China by joining the alliance with the United States. I think in the previous government, uh, South Korea hesitated to join the Indo-Pacific Initiative uh, and then tried to re remain relatively the ambiguous and hesitant uh, to jump on the Indo-Pacific framework uh, in the hope of developing very good relationship with North Korea, uh, establishing peace on the Korean Peninsula, and then working closely with China to enhance a peace and stability in the region. Uh, however, uh, it ended up with a strategy of muddling through, as Professor Moon mentioned, so instead of that, the Yun government took the strategy of strategic clarity, uh, making clear that the South Korea will stand with the United States. Uh, why? Uh, first of all, the, the China didn't give a kind of a big favor to South Korea, despite the South Korea's continuous efforts to improve the relationship continue to intimidate and then retail, uh, intimidate us, and then try to use high-handed approach to South Korea, uh, and even, didn't even uh, the relieve the, the kind of, the, the, a, lot, a lot of restrictions uh, the imposed on South Korea. I think that's the reason, and China paid the price, in a sense that the anti-Chinese feeling grew up very rapidly, especially among the younger generations uh, in South Korea. So the, not only that, uh, we expect the China play a very, con very good role, positive role in inducing North Korea to toward uh, denuclearization. Actually, the the effect was not that much uh, effective, uh, and then uh, also the the hope or promise that North Korea will denuclearize uh, and then join the join our march toward peace and stability in Korean Peninsula didn't come true, actually. So then uh, the, what should be our choice? We have to face a increasing nuclear and missile threats from North Korea. And then we should be much more realistic, having, rather than having a hopeful thinking that uh, they will eventually do something. But uh, the, the, the change is so uh, threatening and imminent so then what you have to think about the strategy of uh, securing our nation, our people from the immediate threat from, from North Korea. So um, what is the best answer? Some people in Korea say that uh, we'd better arm with uh, nuclear uh, arms like North Korea does. But that's not a kind of, I, everybody knows that, I, that that's, that's a hope. But uh, that's not a realistic strategy for an internationalized and global trading country like uh, South Korea. Uh, but okay, remaining self-help and then just to rely upon ourselves, possibly still we, we have some uh, the strategic deficiencies there. Then what is it, the next choice? 
it would be uh, the, uh, the strengthening alliance with the United States and uh, in, uh, the increasing trilateral cooperation to defend South Korea from North Korean threat. That does not mean that we are necessarily taking very antagonistic policy toward uh, North Korea. Uh, the, as, as a kind of a bold, uh, audacious uh, plan to support North Korea, if and when North Korea is subst substantially denuclearizing uh, themselves, then South Korea is ready to help North Korea and open the dialogue channel to North Korea. At the same time, well, so even the, the conservative Union government is open to a kind of a conditionless a humanitarian assistance to North Korea. So it's not necessarily a kind of anti-North Korea policy as is supposed by uh, many. So, uh, and uh, even though the Saudi Union government uh, voluntarily choose, chose uh, a strengthening alliance with the United States, uh, it does not necessarily mean that uh, we are going to irritate China. Uh, we are not going to stand against China, and then we will continue to work with China, not only in economic and other terms, but uh, uh, I, I firmly believe that uh, China cannot be an alternative to the United States in terms of securing South Korea from North Korean attack. Uh, North Korea, China can provide the security to South Korea. So in, but in, in, except those areas, uh, the, 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 even the young, uh, even the young government, whoever, whatever government it would be, South Korea will continue to work with uh, uh, the China in a cooperative way. And uh, so in that connection, uh, I think uh, the joining, uh, the, Indo the much more proactively joining in the Pacific framework is necessary, but it is not necessarily meant by joining part. Uh, the, if I talk to the people uh, in the government, not only in, in Korea, Japan, and, and also in the United States, it's, we are at the stage of consolidating Quad rather than changing it to Penta or uh, other formula. So, and then the Quad has a kind of a misleading uh, con the con conception that this is a security alliance against China. So we, uh, I think uh, we, it has a kind of a very double meaning uh, to South Korea. So rather than trying to join quad, the Quad at the, uh, at the moment and then trying to be a member of a Penta, at the moment we, uh, South Korea is uh, very willing to join a, the Quad uh, the working groups in all different areas like uh, Corona or the technological area or the others. Uh, so also, uh, the um, in, even in the, uh, the quad framework, it's not necessarily quad, but it's a kind of Indo-Pacific economic framework, a kind of uh, the soft and economic area. Uh, so Korea is very willing to jump on, jump on the game, but uh, we don't want to send the signal that uh, we are standing against China in a military way. But uh, at the same time, uh, the, on the Taiwan issue, there's a kind of a, a lot of debate uh, uh, in Korea that what can Korea do uh, in, in, term, in times of a Taiwan cri Strait crisis, but uh, I don't think South Korea will uh, actively join militarily uh, to fight a war against the Ch China. Uh, I don't think that is the case. Uh, but uh, maintaining peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait is critically important for a country like South Korea's international trading state. And we have to pass it through all this, uh, the Taiwan Strait and the South China Sea area. So uh, securing that area safely uh, from free navigation, uh, from free navigation is critically important for, for us. So, uh, we're, so we will continue to watch the game very uh, carefully. And then uh, we'll stand against any attempt to change the status quo by force uh, and then abide by international rules of the game. Uh, in order to maintain the, uh, the, 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 re, the regional stability. Uh, and I, I just mentioned just one thing, uh, I, 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 can, I can detail it a little bit further, the, the relationship with Japan. Uh, so the, uh, in the previous administration, the, our relationship with Japan was really deteriorating, and uh, there are many Japan experts, including me, uh, say that uh, the Korea-Japan relations under the Moon administration was the worst. 
uh, ever uh, since the normalization in uh, 1965. So uh, with a better uh, fixed relationship, uh, first of all, to, uh, to cope with the regional security challenges, and, and especially thinking of, of, of uh, the North Korean challenge, uh, we have to cooperate in order to uh, safeguard our, uh, our interest. So the, we are speeding up the process of uh, the, the ameliorating the relationship between the two countries. That does not mean that it will be very smooth. Uh, I, if you can read Korean, I, I had a long interview with the Digital Times uh, about how Korea-Japan relations should be and how, what kind of efforts that the government is, is paying uh, to, to make it better. Uh, but, uh, I say just one thing. Uh, in the pe in the previous administration, of course, the the historical controversies is so thorny, and then very risky to handle. So in the previous administration, not because the Moon government didn't have any uh, intention, but didn't have the courage to touch upon it and move forward. Uh, so uh, the the Yun government, uh, rather than neglecting the issue, tried to grab it and try trying to make it uh, move forward. Uh, in order to find uh, good ways to uh, make uh, uh, the relationship a little bit better. Uh, as for the details, if there is any question, I will uh, answer the question uh, later. But uh, as uh, I'm speaking too long, I'm stop here and then uh, respond to the questions later. Thank you, Dr. Park. I appreciate the way you picked up on some of the points made earlier. Uh, Scott. Okay, well, I have to confess that I probably read my email too fast when uh, I got this invitation from Dr. O uh, to come and participate uh, in this panel. Uh, and I saw that uh, uh, Moon Jung-in and Pak chul hee were gonna be here and I definitely wanted to be present uh, for that discussion uh, of South Korean foreign policy uh, because actually if you combine both of their uh, former students, they're probably controlling the policy uh, <laughs> of the government, regardless of who is the president uh, of South Korea. But then Dr. O indicated that the price of admission was actually that I needed to also make a presentation. Uh, so here I am. Um, uh, and I just want to address uh, my view of the, the topic, rethinking the regional order uh, and implications for the alliance. Um, and my observation is very simple, and that is that we've had four iterations of regional order so far. Um, uh, and each of them have different implications for the U.S.-Korea alliance. The first one, of course, is the uh, Sino-centric dynastic order uh, that we saw up to the end of the 19th century. And of course, at that time, uh, Korea was subservient to Beijing and really couldn't assert itself on foreign policy. And in the waning days of that order, we saw that uh, a rationale for then King Kojong to reach out and establish a relationship with the United States 140 years ago actually was to have a closer relationship with a powerful country that was far away from Korea as a way of trying to grapple with the um, impositions of uh, being a small country in a very contested regional context. Uh, the second uh, iteration uh, is really the, uh, the Japanese imperial regional order. Uh, and we know that that also really had catastrophic implications for South Korea uh, and certainly uh, nothing in terms of a U.S.-Korea relationship. Then we have the uh, American-led uh, liberal order. Uh, and I would argue that actually with the uh, alliance, uh, that has been a configuration that has been very successful for South Korea. It's actually enabled South Korea to, um, to develop a significant capacity. Uh, but we're at the twilight of that phase. Maybe it's already passed and now we are in uh, a phase of contested regional order between the U.S. and China. Uh, and this is complicated because uh, the U.S. and South Korea have this alliance relationship, uh, but I think that it is pretty clear that um, um, 
if the balance of power changes between the US and China, uh, and China becomes the norm setter and the rule setter for the region, uh, it's gonna put a lot of strain on alliance managers between the US and South Korea to be able to sustain uh, an alliance relationship. And we are at a good moment between uh, uh, President Yoon and the Biden administration, uh, precisely because the Yoon administration has put the United States at the center of its foreign policy. Uh, but you know, this is also uh, in a context where the US is still uh, really uh, um, capable of, of providing some measure of order and contestation. Uh, and so it might, it, I think it's going to get harder uh, for the U.S.-Korea relationship uh, if indeed we see a transition to uh, an order in which China actually is more powerful than the, for the United States. But also I'm watching very closely the Korean debates uh, about how to manage this particular issue and I see two strands of debate that actually uh, our speakers, uh, our Korean speakers have both touched on that I think are very important to watch. Um, and one of them is the question of how Korea positions itself vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, US-China contestation. Uh, and there, uh, interestingly, Professor Moon talked about uh, essentially uh, building a middle power coalition as a hedge against major power rivalry. Uh, and an, another approach uh, that uh, maybe this is just, um, uh, that, that was not mentioned, uh, but that I think uh, you know, is part of some of the Korean thinking, is actually building a closer relationship with North Korea as a way of gaining strategic depth uh, in order to hedge against that rivalry. And of course, under current circumstances, uh, with North Korea shooting off missiles, uh, that seems to be a very remote possibility, but it is a part of the discussion. Uh, and then the other debate that I think was also touched on uh, that I believe is important is the question of the relationship uh, in South Korean foreign policy uh, between values and interests. Uh, and as was indicated earlier, well, we'll put it this way, you get into trouble uh, as an administration uh, if it is perceived that values and interests are not aligning with each other. Uh, and it will be very difficult for any South Korean uh, leader uh, to um, place a premium on values in situations where it appears that that is occurring at the expense of Korean interests. Uh, and so I think that that is the other critical strand of debate uh, as related to how Korea navigates uh, the current uh, situation uh, that it faces. And I may just add as a footnote, since the geoeconomic topic came up, you know, one of the really interesting areas for South Korea right now that everybody is focusing on, especially in the context of the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, is, you know, well, what does it mean when... Um, uh, technology is securitized uh, and you see a greater premium on um, uh, cooperation in terms of supply chain resiliency, but the expense of the efficiencies that come with a fully globalized world. And I do think that South Korea is uh, having a very interesting and uh, I think it's going to be a complicated debate over that issue uh, because the way in which supply chain resiliency at, is framed does also entail some kinds of costs as we move to a world in which some portions of the technology market uh, are bifurcated. Uh, and it comes at a cost to all of us actually uh, in terms of efficiency and um, uh, size of market, uh, but uh, the bet is that there will be benefits in terms of relative uh, safety, safety and resiliency uh, in that context. So let me just stop there. Scott, thank you. This has been a very rich uh, uh, set of topics that have already been introduced. Um, my job is to think of where do, you, where do we go from here. There's a lot. I'm, I'm going to do this. I mean, first of all, I'd say I, I really hope we can have kind of exchange among the panel. Uh, pretty freely, and then I said, get your questions ready, because in about uh, 10 or 15 minutes, I'll open it up to the floor. 
Um, Scott, maybe I'm going to kind of start where you, you ended and, and, and also <laughs> go back to where Dr. Duran um, started. And, and I was struck in a way by, I think you started off by, by talking about Taiwan, actually. Uh, and uh, I, I think it's probably important, especially when we have visitors here from Korea after so long we haven't really visited, to kind of maybe reflect. I mean, certainly my, my sense, and maybe Scott, you, you're, you live in Washington too, but uh, I'm really struck by how, how Taiwan is, is kind of an obsession right now in, in foreign policy circles and, and, and in the United States in a way that I, I don't perceive it being in, in Korea, whether it's just looking at the press or the kind of people you talk to. And in Korea, and I, I, I was there a few weeks ago, um, it's all about the IRA. Uh, and it's all about uh, uh, whether or not, in a way, the Biden administration is going to live up to this, this partnership this, uh, that, uh, that the UN administration uh, has placed uh, so much uh, uh, weight on and which, uh, which President Biden and President Yoon laid out in such effusive fashion. Uh, just a few months ago, and yet in Korea you have, and I don't want to get into the, this afternoon's discussion too much, but there is an overlap here. Uh, the discussion is, is all about uh, words like betrayal and stab in the back and so on and so forth. So uh, you know, when, we, when we think about rethinking the regional order, it, it, in, in some ways it's, it's like each side is feeling different parts, if I can mix my, my metaphors here, of, of the blind man and the elephant, that we're feeling different parts here. And, and so I guess I just kind of put that out there, maybe wind back to you, Dr. Duran, and say, I mean, on this question of Taiwan, and, and you, you started off with that, and you also talked about um, the, the missile testing. Of course, there are, there are military exercises going on as well. I mean, there certainly is a ramp up of, of a lot of activity going on uh, in the East Asia region. But I, I, one, I mean, I, I thought I heard from your remarks that you, you were kind of making a connection between uh, Chinese activity vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan and North Korean missile tests. Do you see this, I mean, to be rather specific, as kind of coordinated in a way? And then China is, uh, now I'm throwing out a lot of things, China uh, uh, pleased to see uh, uh, North Korea ramping things up? And I think maybe, again, I'm, I'm, there's a lot of things I'm kind of throwing out there now that, that would take us to discussion of also how does this rethinking of the regional order look from the point of view of Pyongyang at some point? Well, I sense very much that I'm sitting next to a very sharp-eyed diplomat who picked out <laughs> a subtlety that I put in, into this uh, to just see what would happen. Uh, I think that despite what most of us would like, that is a, 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 a North Korea that is uh, very independent, is potentially uh, progressive, is... Uh, willing to do talks with, certainly with South Korea and maybe with the United States, um, and is separate in any case from uh, a lot of the other uh, relations in the Asian area. I think that there is more communication going on than, uh, in fact, many analysts would like to maybe see or would like to admit. Uh, this business of flying over territory, that is about as obnoxious an action as one can imagine. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's uh, five miles up or 500 feet up, it still is a threat to the sovereignty and the independence of the countries involved. And, uh, you know, looking at this, uh, South Korea might say, well, will we be next? And my response is, sure. If uh, anybody backs off and, uh, and, and doesn't provide a lot of support, uh, I see no reason why there won't be that kind of intimidation in South Korea too. So it seems to me that if, for example, uh, if God is correct that uh, things are changing very significantly in terms of power. I look at power relationship extensively in my own work, as, as you know from the <laughs> old days. Uh, and I'm not convinced that overall uh, China is even really close to the United States in power. But it is increasing its power. That's the point. But at a rate which is falling off. If that's not complicated enough, uh, we can go into it more extensively. Uh, and I would say, in any case, just to have that question raised in the way that it is raised here means that South Korea is going to have to look around and 
uh, become creative, imaginative. I think its principal uh, support is certainly going to come from the United States, and I don't believe that's going to be weakened. But that's not enough. You have to think about the region in a larger context. And I agree with the discussion about, uh, despite the complexities and difficulties of working out the relationship with, with Japan, that's a place that you, it's going to have to happen because Japan is facing exactly the same kinds of, of pressures and threats that the other countries are. Now, a plausible, it seems to me, a plausible way of dealing with this is to look for a multilateral solution where there are other, other players and other partners. Um, who could, in, particularly in peacetime, be very helpful. Uh, and frankly, I don't see any other than the Quad. So I know this is a shock. This is a hard thing to reflect on. It's, uh, it suggests risks and so on. But let me tell you, it's a long-term investment. And in the absence of that kind of multilateral support, it's going to be a cold, hard period of time. You. I think you raised two you know, important questions. Uh, IRA issue is a really big issue in South Korea, and I hope that the second session will be addressing that issue too. You may go back to the early 1990s. You know, there was a trade war between the United States and South Korea. You may recall there was an extensive anti-American sentiment in South Korea over the issue of trade issues at a time Bush administration was putting very heavy pressure on South Korea to open up its market. And prior to that, you know, the Congress was introducing Jenkins bill, Thurmond bill, and putting a lot of pressures on South Korean textile exports, and et cetera. But what I'm worried is, as you pointed out, slap in the you know, back is kind of word widespread in South Korea. You know, President Biden had this wonderful session with Chairman Jung Hee Sun. The, on the day he left Seoul, then he gave more weight to Chairman Jung Hee Sun than President Yoon Song Yeol, and then went back to the United States, and Congress passed the you know, Inflation Reduction Act, and that really shocked the South Koreans. And I really, if really the United States wanted to improve alliance tie with South Korea, the United States got to really fix this ILA you know, problem. And as the Taiwan issue, Korea is much more in delicate in a situation, okay? And in fact, even American forces in South Korea cannot be mobilized to the Taiwan front, okay? The United States has a second infantry division, which is very mecha heavy mechanized division. They cannot fight in the Taiwan Strait. And the United States has a Seventh Air Force, which has about 55 F-16 fighters. After two to three mid-air failing, they would fight just 10 to 15 minutes and should come back. Therefore, even the assets of 7th Air Force in South Korea can be more effectively used to defense of southern Japan rather than Taiwan. Uh, if that being the case, then it would be extremely difficult for South Korean government to mobilize its own combat forces to support the Taiwan. Okay, therefore, South Korean involvement will be much more so-called uh, logistic support and, and rear area support and coordination kinds of things. Uh, therefore, if you look at some you know, opinion data, you know, surprisingly, more than 70% of South Koreans want the South Korea to be neutral at the time of crisis over Taiwan, Taiwan. or South China Sea. But that, that's a reality. Therefore, on the one hand, as Professor Park Chali pointed out, we have widespread anti-Chinese sentiment, but when we come up with a real time for decision, you know, overall sentiment in South Korea will change. And you know, instead of anti-Chinese sentiment, more pragmatic pursuit of interest will prevail over that kind of public sentiment. That, that is the way I see, you know. But again, I, I'm in full agreement with the professor in you know, Charles Doran about the multilateral solution to the problem. ILA is a classical example of protectionism, right? And uh, it is very, I know, and uh, the United States has to pursue worker-centric you know, trade policy, middle-class-centric trade policy, and et cetera. But the United States is a big country. It's a so-called hegemonic country, which has been creating new norms, principles, rules, and procedures to govern, to govern international affairs. And the United States should 
go back old in a speed of in a get and in the breadth in the, in the system. I don't know, all politics are local, <laughs> but uh, still, you know, America can show its leadership. Okay, uh, three short points related to, to the Taiwan issue. Uh, one last year, uh, I had the pleasure of having a quadrilateral dialogue together with the Minister Kim, uh, Professor Moon, and Omian, and uh, Fuing in China, uh, organized by the the uh, Rhine Institute and East Asia Foundation, and then we re reached the kind of the, the the rough consensus among all those, all in different, our Japanese side, the Fujisaki uh, at the Nakasone Institute. Uh, a lot of consensus that uh, we should not support any attempts to change the status quo using force uh, in the Taiwan area. Uh, at the same time, we should not encourage uh, independence of Taiwan. Uh, so the, we have to avoid both extreme position. Uh, that's critically important, and then South Korea will continue to support the position. And second, I think uh, the maintaining stability and peace uh, in the Taiwan Strait is quite important, as I told you, but uh, we have to abide by international rules uh, rather than a bilateral or something. So we uh, play the game according to the rules game, rules of the game in the international society is critically important, and I think the uh, Korean government will uh, take that position. And third, I think uh, in times of any uh, contingencies in the Taiwan Strait, as Professor Moon mentioned, I think we have a limited capability to move on. But uh, the first priority for Korea is that to maintain enough substantial uh, defense capability against the North, potential North Korean threat. Uh, so that's, uh, we, if you lose that, I think we are losing a lot, uh, not just a small. So it's a very, quite important to do that. IRA, uh, the, there is a kind of a, too much talks about IRA in Korea uh, when you talk about the United States IRA, IRA, IRA. So, but uh, uh, the, in the previous session with the CRS, I, I told, I, I, I raised the question, but uh, at the moment, it is a trade issue uh, and commerce issue, but uh, it can easily develop into a very unexpected political game in the, pa in, in the future. So, uh, and then some experts and opinion leaders in uh, South Korea understand that something is going on uh, be, uh, before the midterm election. So after the midterm election is over, we expect some kind of uh, the, the kind of uh, the measures to cope with it, either by amending the bills, or by executive order, or uh, the taking some kind of different measures in the Congress. Uh, so I hope that uh, the problem would be mitigated uh, in, in some fashion. But if not, uh, there is a kind of a emerging frustration among the Korean public that uh, we are not treated as the uh, most, uh, most favored nations despite uh, Korea, US, FDA. So, so we should expect something having a kind of a, um, measures that does not discriminate South Korea. Uh, I, I know that IR is not specifically targeted against the Korea, but actually we uh, get kind of uh, the, the, some uh, the cause uh, related to that. And second, that uh, we should not forget that happened to be after the Yun government. Uh, we, the, we, the Samsung, Hyundai, S, SK, and all the major companies are investing a lot in the United States, more than trillion dollars. So then uh, when we are investing a lot to produce uh, good, work, good work, workplaces in the United States, United States, US government and Congress is not considering South Korean position and then you, you just kind of stand with it. I don't think a South Korean public will go with it. So I think you have to take care of it and then I, uh, I hope some good measures will come up after the midterm election. Thank you. Um, I may just return to two points. Uh, one is that uh, in this environment of a contested regional order, 
I think that we see very clearly that in terms of impact on the alliance, it actually has meant that we're spending a lot more time in the alliance context talking about China uh, as opposed to talking about uh, North Korea. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is partly in relationship to the aperture, uh, the expanding aperture um, through which Korea needs to see the lens of security in this context of contestation. Uh, and then the second point that I wanted to raise, because I think there's a second feature of regional order that, uh, that Chungin mentioned about whether or not we're entering into a new Cold War. Uh, and that is very relevant uh, to uh, the North Korea issue. It's part of our discussion uh, because um, I think we're just beginning to grapple with the way in which a strengthened North, North Korea-China relationship and a strengthened North Korea relationship uh, may, uh, and, and the broader geopolitical circumstances, may uh, engender opportunism on the part of North Korea. Or, theoretically, it could also engender constraint. And I think that Professor Durand suggested China could constrain North Korea. And so I think that's actually a really interesting question about this new aspect of uh, North Korea's relations with China and Russia. Do they feel um, emboldened, mm -hmm. or do they feel constrained at this moment? What do you think? <laughs> right now, it's looking a little bit like they're emboldened. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it's an important question. Yeah, your comments, Scott, I'm going to turn for questions, so get them ready here now, but it, about uh, uh, the impact on, on, on the alliance of, of, of thinking about the, the changing regional order. I mean, there is also a rethink of the world order going on, and it goes also to these questions of multilateralism and values and, and so on. And uh, I'm, I'm thinking of that because I actually is, I'm, I'm reading a book right now, not, a, not about Asia. It's called Not One Inch, and it's an historian's uh, excellent account of the work, the diplomacy <laughs> that uh, went from the fall of the wall to the decision to expand NATO. Uh, and uh, you know that's a that's an order now you know being being rethought and uh, also I guess the question I, I think in my mind and all of our minds is what extent is that also impacting the kinds of conversations we have the way that uh, South Korea sees its choices North Korea for that point uh, for that matter and 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 the regional order in East Asia um, I uh, will open the floor up now for some questions I see this hand going up first could you please I there may be a mic there's a microphone coming. And if you could please introduce yourself and make your question succinct. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Uh, hi, thank you so much uh, for this uh, panel discussion. My name is Alice Zhang. I'm a doctorate in international affairs student here at SAIS. Um, uh, I'm very interested in the topic and uh, especially on the U.S., Taiwan, uh, South Korea, North Korea uh, topic. And so thank you for, for sharing the insights. And my question is regarding uh, the U.S. side. Uh, given the current situation in Asia, uh, what would you recommend for the U.S. to engage and interact in the region? And what role, specific roles that U.S. can play um, from the South Korean perspective, but also just in terms of uh, uh, given the situation in the whole region, uh, what would you recommend? Thank you. From the South Korean perspective, what should the U.S. do? To engage, um, at, at what level of engagement? Okay, well maybe that's, yeah, Thank you. Okay, now we are having a you know, <laughs> midterm election on November 8th, okay, and this President Xi Jinping will be, you know, elected as third term president on October 16th, right? And then he will be inaugurated February next year. But after February next year, I hope, really hope that the U.S. and China can come up with a really grand bargaining on all those issues, mm. okay? Now, if you look at the U.S.-China relations, there's three areas, cooperation for climate change and pandemics and proliferation nuclear proliferation issues, competition in trade and technology, confrontation in geopolitics and values. I really hope that the President Biden and President Xi Jinping would sit together and come up with all those you know, issues in one basket and come up with a major bargaining. We cannot really afford U.S.-China confrontation 
in our part of the world. There is a kiss of death for us. If we really, we, I really hope that the U.S. and China can come up with some kind of grand solution to the problem for the sake of peace in East Asia as well as in the world. Do you think Xi Jinping will be ready to do that? I think so. But you, you, you <laughs> didn't try. The U.S. didn't try. I really don't think so. You, the United States has been unilaterally uh, demanding China to do that, you know. But the, I really don't think the U.S. come up with a you know, real approach, you know, didn't approach China with real authenticity and real good intention. That is my observation, mm -hmm. okay? my personal mm -hmm. observation. Dr. Park? Also, you might say something uh, about, like, I'm gonna be, uh, should the U.S. be doing something more or different, if it's doing anything, vis-a-vis -vis Japan are okay as well? Okay, uh, the, uh, as for the re U.S. role to engage, I would will, I will, I will suggest an idea that uh, I hope the Biden administration would raise the priority of North Korea a little bit more. Uh, the, I think Trump gave too much priority on North Korea issue for the TV show, but uh, but uh, the Biden administration under the Biden administration, the North Korean issue is too low priority. Uh, so I think some medium level priority is needed in order to solve the handle this problem. But the, too much preoccupied, I understand. But the Russia and China and the North Korea is rather neglected. So I hope uh, the priority would be uh, enhanced a little bit more. As for the uh, Japan relations, I think uh, Biden administration is doing utmost efforts to arrange and coordinate all these uh, efforts. Uh, but I think they're on the, on the right track, uh, basically. But uh, the, rather than just as remaining as a bystander to as an active facilitator of uh, dialogue and communication, uh, to speed up the process uh, on uh, at the leaders' level, but I'm not that much uh, worried about the President Yoon's government. I'm a little bit worried about the Kishida's uh, initiative. So I hope uh, they talk to they talk to uh, the, uh, the Prime Minister Kishida a little more to come up with a much more proactive agenda to ameliorate the relationship. Thank you. Uh, yes, over here. I'm uh, Peter Humphrey, an intelligence analyst and a former diplomat. I was very much hoping Korea would join the, the Quad because I knew the name would be the Pentagon. Um, but I guess we're not going to see that. I am very concerned about our collective strategy with respect to uh, East Asia in that it is abundantly clear that those problems don't disappear until the Kim family is deposed and the Communist Party of China is broken. So, having successfully identified the Clausewitzian center of gravity, where's the effort to bring about those ends? Where's the campaign? Where are the clandestine actions? Where are the quiet talks between the secret services of Japan, Korea, and the US? to list the thousand recommendations to nibble away at the Communist Party and the Kim family. Where is any of that? I'm pretty deeply in touch. There's none of that. It's completely non-existent. And I hate magical thinking. All right, I'll take that as a comment, unless anyone was, yeah. uh, I saw a hand over here. Yes. Hi, my name is Yang Sun Kim from KBS, Korea Broadcasting System. Thank you for coming and having us. And well, uh, recently, the North Korea launched a lot of missiles, and it, it just alleviated it very much. Um, uh, hi. <laughs> yeah, attention in North Korea and South Korea and East Asia and Peninsula, Korea Peninsula, definitely. Then um, the President Yoon talked a lot about that we need uh, action, not a word. And uh, as a result, the, the U.S. and the Korean Army had a bilateral uh, military training, and we also launched a missile. But we are very curious and worried that uh, it will be um, like a dead end. And what can we do if the U.S 
done nothing like this for like an one and a half years for a Biden administration. Just to talk and we want a, we are open to the diplomacy and something like that. But we just seen nothing. Uh, well, because I don't know anything. <laughs> so, do you have any thought that to you know we have to break through this? moment or dead end or, or not, we feel like it, it will be alleviated to rear dead end. Actually, you answer. Yeah. <laughs> you Don't represent the no. of your government. Okay. <laughs> North Korea specialist first. <laughs> Please. Uh, well, uh, we can, uh, maybe I'll turn to Scott maybe first. Scott, you can because <laughs> Scott, would, okay, well, I mean, is, you think that's a, a fair uh, description? Since I have uh, no responsibility or authority, um, I, I, what I've been anticipating um, really over the course of the past few months uh, is that it's probably going to take a crisis in order to get to negotiation. Mm -hmm. And I think that we're on the front end of uh, the crisis building. Uh, but we're not really close to uh, the crisis point at which it's going to lead to uh, an opening for dialogue. But I think that there is a really worrisome in a sequence, you know, that North Korea test launched the intermediate range ballistic missile. The next step will be you know, obviously ICBM and the seventh nuclear testing. If the North Korea goes through that sequence, then it will be extremely difficult uh, to resume any meaningful dialogue. But given the past, judged on the past behavior, North Korea will think that the uh, even if if they if they undertake seventh nuclear testing, that crisis will lead to the new set of you know dialogue and negotiation. But this time it will be very difficult because the Yun Song Yil government has a different attitude, and also the Biden administration will have a different kind of view too. Therefore, I personally hope that the, before North Korea moves into IBM test launching and the seventh nuclear testing, the United States. Uh, should take a more bold approach to North Korea to have to resume dialogue. There is, uh, uh, there should be the essence of new preventive diplomacy vis-a-vis -vis North Korea. But if you read very carefully Kim Jong Un's speech at the Supreme People's Congress uh, the, the, in September, uh, there are, I see some you know room for dialogue and negotiation. But that you know proposal should come from the United States. Therefore, the Biden administration should look into, you know, read, should read North Korean intention more carefully and should come up with some measures to you know, break the, the vicious circle which is going on. Well, why don't you be a little bit more specific about what you want to see? <laughs> mm. But uh, that one in the, in the private setting. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, just I don't want to be quoted. <laughs> <laughs> it's KBS asking. Yeah. They'll never quote you. <laughs> uh, my, my personal observation is that we are in the process of learning each other in a new fashion. Uh, the North Korea is facing a new South Korea at the moment. Uh, if, if they prov continue to provoke us and then uh, they produce a crisis moment, Usually, South Korean government to just uh, reach, reach out their, your, our hands and then let's talk. I don't think we will do it the, out of uh, kind of a pressure from North Korea, uh, where I hope North Korea make a kind of a spontaneous decision, come out to talk for denuclearization and, uh, and other peace measures, rather than, okay, I will, I will continue to intimidate you, okay? Then uh, you will see a kind of a totally opposite result continue to strengthening U.S.-Korea alliance and then continue to upgrading of the trilateral cooperation. Is that North Korea wants? So, so that's, I think they are learning. And we are learning at the same time that, uh, well, even though we are prepared, that they continue to escalate the situation. So we have to think about how to de-escalate the situation, how to open dialogue channel uh, with North Korea. So we are in the process of doing that. But I think we have to, uh, get out of the kind of illusions or some myths we have that uh, if, con if North Korea continue to that, we will acknowledge North Korea as a virtual nuclear weapon state. Never. 
We will continue to pursue denuclearization, first even, of all. Even at and the expense of war? Uh, yeah, whatever. It's <laughs> whatever? <laughs> uh, well, right. because uh, the, the security of South Korea is, goes first rather than anything else. But I think a securing which, nation... Which is more important? No, securing you, you nation... You wanted to is, keep the security... You, know, you can go for war for the sake of security? We will have a discussion later. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and also the... The, we should not be the, 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 the kind of, uh, the North Koreans say that we will use nuclear weapon in a peaceful way and never uh, in an offensive way. I don't believe that. You see the new, new nuclear, nuclear doctrine they announced by North Korea. We should be very careful. No, they uh, never so said the, that one. No, 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 no. <laughs> but we'll have a personal discussion Clearly we're again. Clearly, we have another <laughs> so, round two. So, so we, we yeah. don't, we don't have to. We do, you should get out of the illusions and then uh, uh, the kind of wishful thinking. And we should see the, the situation very realistic way, and then and then but have a hope of uh, getting better than this. Yeah. Yeah. What what worries me a little bit is that on the one hand, I see a great deal of discussion about the fact that the only way we're going to get really meaningful changes to get the United States negotiating more with China uh, and the, the, the sense that uh, indeed most of the things that are significant and important, important here are going to be the result of this U.S.-China interaction. The reason I'm concerned about that is because the events that are evolving don't seem to me to be directly involving China and the United States at all but rather are affecting the countries in the region. Yes, with Taiwan, but also with South Korea and with Japan. They all, you're, they're all in the same kind of situation of having to face in increased bullying, challenges, and uh, symbolic acts of domination. And I don't see the uh, a great enthusiasm on the part of uh, either North Korea or China uh, to negotiate. Rather, I see them pushing and shoving and, and creating problems. So now, if that's the case, then we can't, it seems to me, resort to um, empty speculation about what ought to be done, what might be done. We have to think about how we can shore up the security that is so desperately needed inside the region against increasing pressure. And how, how is that security going to be provided? You know, to what extent are the, are the countries in the region going to have to do more? You know, I can look at the Taiwan situation and say the Taiwanese have a dreadful set of military policies to try to protect themselves. All kinds of errors and mistakes, I think, have been made. Well, you know, it, a lot more could be done to put themselves in a stronger position. And if I may say so, our good friends in, in South Korea aren't going to be able to just focus on genuine and real and serious problems of trade. We have to talk about real and genuine problems of security. Things have changed and are changing even faster. So what actions are going to be taken by the countries in the region to do this? What worries me greatly, in the paper, I didn't talk about nuclear proliferation. I talked about enhanced acquisition. See, that's, that's a new concept. Um, but there's, uh, what can happen is that suddenly they can, one can lurch forward, and suddenly you have more nuclear powers, admittedly nu nuclear powers, in the area. And that is going to really make things more difficult. So, it seems to me that what we need is some serious, hard thinking on the part of Taiwan, Japan, and South Korea about what they can do in terms of their own security. And then the United States can come in and, and assist, but it can't all be put on the, on the shoulders of the United States. Well, I think we're just warming up, but this is a marathon, <laughs> not a race. Uh, but I think we've made a good start. I want to thank all the panelists for joining us today. I want to thank the audience uh, for your attention, your great questions, uh, and for your interest. And we'll make way for the next panel after a few minutes. But thank you very much. I've learned a lot. Give me a lot to think about. Okay.
Good afternoon. Um, thank you for joining us for the second panel, U.S. Rock Cooperation on Technology and Innovation Approaches to Establish Resilient Global Supply Chains. Thank you for staying with us, um, for those who are um, joining us from the opening session. Um, since I already offer uh, my remarks at the uh, beginning, I'd like to keep my remarks brief and would like to really get insights from our distinguished speakers. I'd like to begin uh, my remarks by asking this question. Why is it important for the United States to enhance um, resiliency and security of global supply chains and to work with its allies and partners? And why does the policy of supply chain focus on advanced and emerging technology? For the United States, um, enhancing self-sufficiency in technology and innovation, both at home and abroad, is key to its national security and especially to U.S.-China competition. The Indo-Pacific region is at a critical turning point in terms of its security and economic architecture. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic era, uh, U.S.-China tensions, enduring tensions, and Russia's invasion of Ukraine, all the things that we already discussed from the first session. And, um, and it's, for those who came just now, uh, first session also spent time to talk about IRA and some economic related issues, um, which is intertwined with um, the hard security issues. And also with the rapid digitalization and technological innovation, the role of advanced and emerging technologies in the national security sector has become more significant than ever. And China is playing an increasing important role at, as both a supply and demand hub in traditional hub and global supply chain network. So um, for the United States, how to deal with China and its dependence on China in a range of key products and retaining like-minded liberal democracies, competitive edge is the key. So therefore, um, realigning supply chains of critical technology has become a top priority agenda, and it is also essential for United, United States key allies and partners like South Korea to have secure and resilient supply chains of key technologies. So I'd like to ask our speakers to offer their initial remarks for five to six minutes about the opportunities and challenges of, uh, with regard to the current effort on, um, on establishing secure and resilient supply chains and what they mean for U.S. raw cooperation. Um, aiming for um, last 10 to 15 minutes um, for the audience Q&A, I think we can move forward uh, with interactive discussions after the initial remarks. Please feel free to interrupt and then ask questions you know, between um, the, the, between the speakers, and which will be about, we're gonna have about 30 minutes, I think. So let's get started. So we have uh, Mr. Goodman to my left. Um, he's a senior vice president for economics and the Simon Chair in political economy at CSIS, where he directs and focuses on international economic policy and global economic governance. Before joining CSIS in 2012, uh, Mr. Goodman served as Director for International Economics on the National Security Council staff, helping the President prepare for global and regional summits, including the G20, APEC, and the East Asia Summit. Minister Yu myung hee she, uh, as you know, uh, was the first woman who um, held this position um, from South Korea as a trade minister. More than 25 years of experience working in the various South Korean government agencies, including the Ministry of Trade, Industry and Energy, and Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade. She's also a visiting professor at the Grad School of International Studies at Seoul National University, um, and, uh, where she obtained a bachelor's and master's, and she has JD from Vanderbilt um, Law School from the United States. Mr. Um, um, and Dr. An Chung Young, who's a distinguished professor of the GSIS at Chungang University, and he's also co-chair at the Korea-India Dialogue. He served as a foreign investment ombudsman um, from 26 to 14, who's a troubleshooter responsible for resolving grievances raised by foreign investors at the Korea Trade Investment Promotion. He was the chairman um, of the Korea Commission for Corporate Partnership and responsible for inducing voluntary collaborations between Korea's big businesses and small and medium enterprises. 
and also chairman of the board of, of the Korea Electronic Power Corporation. And he's a former chairman of the Presidential Regulatory Reform Commission from 2010 to 2012. And uh, last, not the least, we have Mr. Kevin Wolf. Um, Kevin is a senior fellow at Georgetown Center for Security and Emerging Technology and a partner in the International Trade Group of Akin Gump Strauss Hauser and Feld. Kevin was the Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Export Administration from 2010 to 2017, where he was responsible for administering U.S. dual-use export control regulations and policy. He was one of the primary drafters and implementators of the Obama administ administration's export control reform effort, which significantly modified U.S. defense trade control involving allied countries. So I'm gonna stop here, and then I'm gonna um, turn to um, Mr. Goodman for your remarks. Thank you. Thanks, Mion. Um, well, I, I usually don't get stage fright anymore from doing um, presentations like this, but I have three reasons that I actually today <laughs> am a little bit nervous. First of all, um, first of all, I'm a SICE alum. And sitting on stage in the Kenny Auditorium is, <laughs> is quite an intimidating thing. Having sat down there many times and seen very distinguished people, I feel not worthy. Um, secondly, I'm with such an incredibly distinguished <laughs> panel all the way down the line here, especially my good friend, Minister Yu. It's a great honor, and I'm quite humbled to be up here with her. And I'm going to let her and the others do more of the talking. Um, and the third reason, actually, you've now relieved me of which was, I was figured that most of the conversation was going to be about electric vehicles and the IRA, but it sounds like <laughs> the previous <laughs> panel took care of that, so we don't have to discuss that. Um, seriously, I'd say, look, I, broad framing, I, I think there has never been a time, in my experience at least, when the U.S. and ROK have more opportunity to uh, cooperate, collaborate on economic issues. Um, I'm not a security guy, although I work at a security-oriented think tank. I'm an economics guy, and uh, I think, you know, we've always had a lot of underlying uh, economic interests in, in line with each other, but we haven't always been able to work together um, cooperatively on, on shared challenges, sometimes <laughs> very successfully. Sometimes we've had to multiply repeat the same efforts like for us. Uh, but, we, but, but I would say there's never been a time when we've been more aligned. And, and, and the potential, the possibilities for cooperation and economics run across a range of different issues. I mean, starting with trade, again, I'll defer to Minister Yu, but, but I think post-chorus, which has obviously been a great success in itself, we have a huge opportunity to work together on um, international trade and regional trade. And again, I only have five minutes, so I'll just, my sound bite on that is, I think it is an urgent priority for the United States and Korea to join um, comprehensive, high standard, regional trade agreements like the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and I chose my words carefully, um, <laughs> um, as soon as possible. I think that is an, a, a critical interest for each of us and both of us. So I think we need to be working towards that objective as soon as possible. Um, we can also talk about IPEF and things that are kind of long, winding pathways to that ultimate objective, but comprehensive, comma, high standard regional trade agreement that is passed by legislatures um, uh, is, I think, what we, we should be doing. Um, in a, a sort of related area, or it's a subset, but it's also everywhere and different, is data governance. I think the, the data is everywhere. We're creating data right now. Um, and uh, there are no internationally accepted rules on, uh, on data. Um, and we need to create them. I think, as I sometimes called it, it's the sort of fifth pillar of global economic governance. If you take the three Bretton Woods pillars and then you add all the energy arrangements that were negotiated in the, or set up in the 70s, including the G7, which was an energy-oriented arrangement um, at the beginning, uh, this data governance story is the one that's missing. We're not going to build a building and shouldn't in Geneva or something, but, but we do need rules and norms and standards, and, and the U.S. and Korean preferred rules and standards are far better than uh, other alternatives. And I'm not just talking about China, uh, Europe as well. We, so I think we have a, a strong interest, and there's a lot of work to be done there. So we should both, as an urgent matter, be applying, among other things, to join the Digital Economy Partnership Agreement, or Arrangement, whatever it's called, uh, Agreement, I guess, um, DEPA, 
uh, which um, is, I think, in our joint interest and individual interest. Um, third is, and I won't talk much about this, but I'll just put it on the table. I think in infrastructure, global infrastructure, I think there's a huge opportunity for the U.S. and Korea to work together, especially in Southeast Asia and South Asia. Um, we need to offer our preferred, again, um, standard or type of infrastructure um, against, particularly in certain areas like um, in uh, infrastructure that is sustainable and infrastructure that is of, the, of a digital variety. I think there's a huge opportunity. We have capabilities that are complementary, and we ought to do more. Again, lots more to say about that. And then to the subject that we're actually talking about here, technology and supply chains, obviously an enormous, um, enormous shared interest, um, shared synergistic capabilities. Um, I don't need to go through the litany of what we're, uh, what we're each good at and both uh, good at together, um, or nor do I need to say why I think this is important because obviously um, there are critical technologies from semiconductors to um, you know quantum computing and and uh, AI that are going to that are going to shape the global economy and each of our individual economies um, even more than they already are uh, some of them and uh, we have a huge stake again in ensuring that we have uh, an ability to produce and and consume uh, uh, those uh, those technologies um, obviously. This has been, and the in, the in Washington, the Biden administration, it's been a day one priority to to work on strengthening technology supply chain, starting with the hundred day review um, that the president um, mandated um, in his first you know few days in office, um, and uh, running through all of the forums that uh, that the Biden uh, administration has been involved in, from the G7 to the Quad to. <laughs> Trade and Technology Council with the with the European Union, um, and Korea is not in all of those things, but is a com subject of conversation in all of those things in this context because it's obviously such a key player. Um, and we've now got a Chips Four Alliance. Uh, we can talk more about that, but I think there's an opportunity there both to promote and protect um, our uh, interests in semiconductors. Um, I think Kevin's going to talk more about some of the protect side of that. Um, there's some big news coming on, on that front that he's going to talk about. But um, I would say the problem in all these areas is that while we are aligned in our interests and I think even in our broad approach, uh, you know, there is some devil in the detail and there's some areas of tension that we're going to have to resolve. And one of them is the one that I jokingly said I didn't want to talk about because I know you want to talk about it, but this electric vehicles thing. I mean, this is not a surprise that we're having this tension over, really, the, 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 there's a tension that I wrote about actually on the second day of the Biden administration. I have a piece called Three Tensions in Biden International Economic Policy, and one of them was this, um, which was that the Biden administration you know, is committed to building back better at home and investing in domestic production and jobs, and that's great as an American. I'm glad he's doing that and, and acting on that, um, but he's also uh, committed to uh, strengthening uh, work with our allies and partners on a, a, all the issues I just talked about, and you know, as predicted, there are going to be some tensions at the at the at the Venn diagram, as it were, where those issues intersect, and and this is an example of, of that. I think, and again, I'm going to save it for the question and answer, but I think this problem is a big one, but it's not um, unfixable. I think I think it's fixable. And so I'm leave it there because I've gone way past my time. So happy to talk about that. Please go ahead. Perfect. Thank you, Minister. Minister Liu. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure to have an opportunity to discuss very uh, this very pertinent topic of enhancing resilient supply chains uh, through Korea-U.S. economic cooperation, especially uh, with my good friend and colleague, uh, Matthew, and also um, other friends from the um, U.S. at uh, this place, uh, size Johns Hopkins. Uh, well, um, actually, you took some of my um, talking points, so I will not repeat the uh, broader trade policy that you just mentioned. I will uh, focus on uh, supply chain uh, resilience. Um, as um, Dr. O mentioned, uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic reduced supply chain disruptions as well as um, um, growing geopolitical tensions and um, 
Russia's invasion of Ukraine. All these have uh, made uh, supply chain resilience a top, the top uh, focus of uh, international trade policy makers around the world, including uh, in the US and uh, Korea. So now the efficiency is being recast in terms of uh, Rely, uh, reliable and resilient supply chains uh, because uh, these days, you know, uh, these, uh, how we can adapt to this uh, growing geopolitical uncertainties is getting more and more important uh, rather than uh, uh, purely, you know, uh, the, rather than uh, getting a uh, uh, lowest cost uh, uh, in this uh, a volatile changing environment. Having said that, uh, today, especially I would like to focus on how Korea and US can uh, enhance our cooperation uh, in regard to supply chain resilience. What could be our opportunities and challenges? Uh, first and foremost, with Korea's global manufacturing capabilities, and also combined with our long history of uh, friendship as well as our uh, commercial ties together with Korea US FTA, Korea can be a vital partner in US efforts to enhance resilient supply chains. And also through our joint um, research and development, as well as mutual investments, we can enhance our collaboration in high tech cutting edge uh, sectors, be it semiconductor, or electric vehicle batteries, or uh, biotechnology, or you just mentioned AI or quantum computing. And uh, we can you know, create synergy effects that can help us stay competitive in these ever-evolving technology sectors. We can also promote um, regional as well as global uh, supply chain resilience through multilateral and plurilateral initiatives such as supply chain pillar in the uh, IPEF, in the Pacific Economic Framework, as well as uh, mineral supply chain uh, partnership, uh, which was launched uh, to um, um, have uh, to discuss challenges and opportunities in responsible mining, processing, and recycling of critical um, 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 materials, critical minerals. Having said that, there are some challenges that we have to overcome and manage. So I'd like to especially emphasize a couple of points that we have to keep in mind. First, the importance of trust building. Well, as you mentioned, there are certain tensions at play. I have not read your you know, three tensions, but you know, I am impressed uh, by uh, your foresight uh, because you just you know, published that uh, article in the first day or in the very second. first, second day of the uh, Biden administration. But in this uncharted territory of supply chain uh, cooperation, there are some tensions at play. While working together to, re to build supply chain resilience, participating countries in the either IPEF or mineral supply partnerships or bilateral initiatives, and also their companies. They are, in some sense, competitors. They compete with each other. So uh, their companies, as well as their government, the truth is they might want to enable their own manufacturing capabilities and supplies within their own territories using their own subsidies or incentives. And maybe in some sense, racing to the bottom rather than racing to the top. So in that sense, it is crucial to foster trust through close consultations and also through mutually beneficial measures. If not, those measures, you know, if we don't rein in protectionist instincts in the process. Some measures that aim at uh, that are aimed at supply chain resilience they could easily slide into protectionism. So I hope that you know, we could work together to 
build and improve uh, resilient supply chains in the region so that uh, we could uh, really help not only the two countries' systems, but also regional and global supply chains uh, to make them more secure and reliable. Uh, if, uh, if those countries participating in those multilateral initiatives, if they come to believe that those initiatives are aimed at making the supply chains resilient for only one country, not for their system, uh, in that case, those corporations' initiatives, it will not last long. Uh, that's my first point, the importance of building trust. The second point is private sector engagement. Whether it is a, a stockpiling or diversification or nearshoring or uh, reshoring, all those measures to, re to build supply chain resilience the decision making will be made at the private sector level, not by the private sector, not by the government. So it's very important to have a close engagement with the private sector at the planning stage as well as execution and implementation stage. Because those private sectors have to make a tough choice in sourcing and producing somewhere between efficiency and resilience, especially greater resilience will come at a price in this high, infl high inflation environment. Given that, all those initiatives, when they need to be executed, we need to give sufficient time for the businesses to adjust to these changes, and also we need to have close consultation uh, with the private sector so that we can reflect the realities that private sector is facing. So those two uh, points I'd like to emphasize so that we can manage these uh, difficult challenges uh, successfully uh, together with, uh, both, uh, together with uh, both, both business sectors. And having said that, all in all, I've seen ups and downs of uh, the Korea-U.S. economic relations. I've uh, participated in Korea-U.S. FTA negotiations back in 2016, and also I was called again in Korea-U.S. amendment FTA amendment negotiations back in 2018. So I can say for sure that uh, I've, we have maintained this mutually beneficial cooperative relationship, overcoming ups and downs and difficult changes and difficulties and cha um, challenges. So I'm confident that uh, we could continue to do so in the future and uh, turn these emerging challenges into new opportunities uh, in the future by closely working together. So I will stop here and we'll answer your um, questions later in the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you so much. So um, Ambassador An, Dr. An, would you like to go first or to Kevin or Kevin? Who would mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Uh, sure, if you like. Um, so uh, no, thank you for um, inviting me and happy to help. Um, as the introduction indicated, I was one of the leaders when I was in the Obama administration of the export control reform effort, which had as one of its core elements um, reducing barriers on defense trade and dual use trade by and among and between close allies. And so as a result, worked very closely with the government of Korea, uh, given the very close relationship to um, reduce or in most cases eliminate the difficulties on sharing of um, export control technology, sensitive technology, particularly military uh, items. And that's a reflection of how things are different now. In those days, um, discussions of what, what meant, what national security meant in the context of what types of items warranted control, what types of items warranted limitation on moving from one country or another, has since the end of the Cold War been focused on items that have some clear relationship to the development, production, or use of either weapons of mass destruction uh, or conventional military items. And the US and Korea are members of four multilateral regimes that identify what those items are. 
Um, when the U.S. Congress amended the Export Control Reform Act and the, the rules governing export controls and the rules governing uh, foreign direct investment in the United States, uh, that really began a debate that given China's change in investment policies, changes in technology acquisition policies, its civil military fusion objectives, its uses of commercial technologies to engage in human rights violations, and the significance of advanced node computing and high-performance semiconductors and other items uh, to uh, achieving a, uh, a, um, um, a significant economic dominance uh, in the world, which is critical to the functioning of an economy and the military, the debate began about whether national security should be defined somewhat more broadly, generally with respect to China. And, and in order to have that debate uh, and for the rules to be effective, the U.S. and Korea and the allies would need to discuss and work together. And it becomes very complicated because uh, we're talking about items that, by definition, are not dual-use items, don't have obvious military applications, but nonetheless warrant potential control given non-traditional um, threats that China presents. And given Korea's close relationship to both the United States and, and having China as uh, a major, a major uh, consumer of its items, this is a difficult question between what national security uh, uh, means with respect to its impact on, on economic opportunities. And, and the, the Trump administration did not define what national security meant. The Congress didn't define what national security meant in this new context. And until two Fridays ago, uh, the Biden administration had not defined it either. And, and I'm referring to uh, a speech that National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan gave to a conference where he explicitly said that we must think about export controls specifically with respect to China in a broader than traditional strategic context. That is, advanced node semiconductors and advanced node computers and advanced node uh, artificial intelligence and quantum computing applications are enabling technologies, even though inherently commercial, for the modernization of the Chinese economy, which is a per se threat to the United States uh, economy, uh, and, uh, and it's what's necessary for the creation of a modern military. And so he said that these types of items are inherently of national security concern and warrant export controls, and he specifically said to freeze China at its current technology capability that exists today and to not allow it to grow. Uh, he explicitly said the era of sliding scales, where he means that technology controls evolve to take into account uh, modernization, must end. And, and this is of a particular importance for Korea because it is, again, a major seller. And uh, whether the Koreans or the Japanese or the Germans will agree to this much more foundational, fundamentally different view of what export control should be is an open question. And, and we will see the debate begin in earnest tomorrow because it's been announced that there's going to be a new export control rule that the U.S. Uh, publishes that will fundamentally change the nature of trade between the U.S. and its allies with China with respect to advanced node semiconductors, uh, artificial intelligence, high-performance computing, and related items. And um, uh, it is a reflection, this is my last comment, it is a reflection of what national security means in a new era given changes in Chinese technology acquisition efforts. And it's going to be very interesting to see if the United States and Korea and the United States and Japan and other very close allies can come together for a harmonized approach toward a common definition of national security. Because without it, what you will have is the U.S. acting alone, asserting its laws outside of the United States to the great frustration of its close allies, such as Korea. If the U.S. and the allies can come together on a common definition of national security that involves these broader strategic considerations that National Security Advisor Sullivan uh, mentioned, then the controls will be more effective and there will be far more supply chain security and resiliency. So to your opportunities and issues point, there is a significant opportunity to address what I believe is a common national security concern in a non-traditional way uh, between the United States and Korea with respect to China, but there's a serious threat that if there can't be a meeting of the minds on what that means and there's not coordinated imposition of the same controls, that it will lead to uh, significant uh, friction, particularly in these high-tech high sectors between the United States, Korea, and other close allies because of the U.S. objectives pertaining to China. Does that help?
Okay, I swear it's all true. Okay. Thank you so much. And um, now I'm gonna turn to um, Investor An. Well, <clears throat> I'm really delighted to be here with distinguished uh, participants, and uh, I'm very glad that Mr. Kuman, you mentioned that the U.S. is ready to join the CPTPP. I didn't say that. I said it <laughs> should be. <laughs> I said it should be. Well, um, I think the uh, in May, uh, President Joe Biden and uh, President Yoon Suk Yeol issued a joint summit statement saying that the U.S. and Korea should promote and protect a leading edge technology, including the semiconductor electric vehicle battery, you know, so on and so on. So I was so thrilled about that joint statement. And then the, the President Biden and uh, Chairman Jung Hee Sun appeared together on the national television coverage, you know, uh, the Chairman Jung Hee Sun of Hyundai Automotive the Group they committed that the, the company is ready to invest $11 billion to Georgia. And then the, uh, President Biden said that we will never let you down. So I was so assured that was indeed a, a critical example of the bilateral cooperation between the US and the Korea. But however, the four months later, President Biden signed the uh, Inflation uh, Reduction Act by eliminating Hyundai, granting the, the you know, consumer tax break. Uh, after seeing that, the, you know, I was so disappointed. In fact, most of the Koreans are so dismayed and confused. Uh, and I think this is a sort of the mismatch between the U.S. industrial policy and the international law. That's the first you know, assessment I would like to make. And that is also a clear violation of the U.S.-Korea, the, the free trade agreement, uh, which is often regarded as gold standard uh, in terms of you know, uh, observing this non-discrimination and uh, uh, also most favored you know, nation uh, requirement. So, in this sense, I think this uh, uh, U.S. Uh, is somehow to provide uh, kind of the, a grace period until the Hyundai automotive plant ready to roll out its first uh, U.S.-made uh, electric vehicle or some equivalent of uh, local you know, content ratio, which could be you know, beneficial for the Hyundai automotive. You know, the reason why I'm saying is this. If uh, Hyundai automotive plant is lost from the consumer data screen for say next two or three years, and then Hyundai consumer will lose its you know product image if they're wiping out the consumer's uh, the, the, uh, brain, and it would be very difficult Hyundai automotive plant to, you know to recover its own the current market ratio say you know nine percent. This would be very much detrimental for Hyundai Automotive to carry on robust uh, the, the business and the reinvestment strategy. If that does not happen, it's going to dampen the uh, new hires uh, in, the, in the United States. And uh, then second, I think this uh, Hyundai Automotive should not trap in the, what we call the uncertainty trap. If U.S. continue this policy and uh, how and the automotive can make a long-term plan on the such uh, unpredictable you know, business environment. So I hope the U.S. Congress and the legislation and the administration can take care of the Korean concerns on this matter. And the second, <clears throat> you know, I want to talk about this uh, bilateral foreign direct investment. Uh, I look at the statistics, uh, the uh, foreign direct investment from Korea to U.S. in the past five years. Uh, uh, it's about the uh, all but $88 billion. However, reverse flow from the U.S. to Korea is just about $9 billion. That means Korea invested about the nine times uh, as the U.S. did you know, in Korea. 
So in this sense, I think we need to somehow uh, maintain the rebalance of this trade deficit between you know, two countries. In this regard, you know, I would like to propose one, the smile curve concept. Uh, President Biden invited you know, four CEOs of major Korean business group at the White House to urge them to invest in semiconductors and so on and so on. So Korea responded so that the U.S. now has full-scale smile because you have the you know, leading automatic design and uh, also research and development, but released the manufacturing activity, South Korea, Taiwan, and you know, so, so forth. But you are still dominant in the global repackaging and marketing and so forth. So once uh, Korea helped the U.S. semiconductor industry in terms of manufacturing, U.S. ended up having a full smile curve. So uh, what I'm proposing is that who knows, you know, hurricane continues to arise and maybe if the factory in the U.S. wipe out, uh, why don't you have a, a backup smile curve facilities in Korea? That means, you know, we really would like to invite a more foreign direct investment from the U.S. in the area of automatic the, the design and uh, you know, the, the also global marketing, repackaging, you know, et cetera. So, uh, that's the point uh, I want to make. And uh, next one, I think the, you mentioned about the Ms. Kevin, the uh, security aspect. I agree with you, semiconductors say under the level of nanotechnology could be regarded as the security item in this regard, I think Korea is ready to join the CHIP4 Act, uh, and Korea is ready to follow the guardrails the U.S. Uh, you know, uh, the, the constructed. But on the other hand, I would like to point out the, the thing that Korea still depends on 40% of the, our semiconductor import from China. Therefore, the U.S. should recognize the okay, distinction between the the high-end nanotechnology semiconductor and medium and low-end technology. I think the U.S. should you know, allow the Korea and the other trade nations to engage with China in the area of medium and the low-level the, the semiconductor. All the high-level, you know, Korea is ready to join okay, the U.S. initiative. And finally, in the Pacific economic framework, I think this does not contain any trade tax, no market access. Okay? Uh, therefore, maybe it might be end up as you know, a, a talk show. Nevertheless, it addresses very important issues, digital trade and uh, the anti-corruption and so forth. So Korea is ready to, willing to you know, join here. We already declared. And uh, as far as that is concerned, China also, you know, already applied for CPTPP, and uh, China is also willing to join the digital trade and so forth. So if any country willing to join IPEF, the fundamental framework, I, there should be the open mechanism and open institution rather than closed one. Let me stop here, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think we have a lot of um, things to follow up. Um, I would like to um, ask two things. First of all, um, please feel free to share any of your reactions to your fellow um, speakers. And then my second question would build on, build on um, Kevin's remarks on the definition of national security. Um, so my question is, do we have common, um, do, is, is it fair to say that um, the U.S. allies and partners um, have common national security concerns? And from the first session, Professor Moon jung -hin, um, he mentioned, and also, you know, Ambassador Ahn, you just mentioned, that um, South Korea, mainland China and Hong Kong account for 60% of the semiconductors ex exports. And um, South Korea has invested of billions of dollars um, in key manufacturing facilities in China, major cities. So, um, for example, so um, if ROC decides to join G4, any possibility for China to employ economic retaliation that we have gone through? Um, or if you think this might be too, um, too drastic 
um, I think we can still think about what is the technology alliance in your view, because we hear about um, this trusted partner network and, and there seems to be a lot of multilateral efforts in terms of enhancing cooperation between the United States and allies and, allies and partners. So what are we trying to achieve from multi, this multilateral cooperative effort? And, and what do you define, how do you define this technology alliance or how do you define, how should we define this, this national security in, the, in this um, technology, technology realm? Um, excellent question and it is the question <laughs> in, in my world. Um, and uh, you know, as I said, since the end of the Cold War, national security in the context of regulating the movement of commodity software and technology across borders was focused on that which had some identifiable relationship to the development, production, or use of a military item or a weapon of mass destruction. And then when you move beyond that uh, objective, then when does it cross into the line of economic protectionism or mercantilism? Um, and, and how do you define a national security threat when it's trying to respond to broader ambitions of China as opposed to something in your hand that's a weapon that you can identify? And, and, and so when you're getting into the economic implications of security, uh, what is in the economic security of the United States, it can be very different than Korea, given the, st the statistics you accurately cited regarding the volume of trade, and thus the desire for having an effective common control for common economic security interests becomes more difficult, given that the impact will fall more heavily on Korea than it will on the United States to achieve a common set of new controls against China that are outside the tradition. And in, in my view, uh, and I've written a significant paper or paper on this that I, I'll share later, um, uh, there is a small group of techno-democracies that have common um, uh, principles of human rights and, and free elections and free press and tolerance and, and free trade generally. Um, that uh, are contrary to the policies that the Chinese government has been establishing over the last decade or so. And in that sense, from those principles of responding to China's strategic dominance objectives, to responding to its human rights abuses, to responding to its desires to upset the supply chain in rare earths and other, there are common interests between the United States, Japan, and Korea, and other close allies. Um, and I would include, frankly, Taiwan in that group um, as well. And, and I'm not in charge anymore, but if I were, I would be appealing to those core common principles mm -hmm. as techno-democracies to develop a common set of controls. Um, and fortunately, the control that's going to be announced tomorrow, as significant as it is when you read in the paper, um, is going to be a US-only control, mm -hmm. uh, which means that the US has not yet been able to develop a common understanding with any ally mm -hmm. Uh, on this new theme of what national security should mean when you're not dealing with items that have some direct relationship to a weapon. Um, so I, I have my view, I've written about it, I hope that and I trust that the administration will keep the outreach up to um, develop a common sense of common security interests and that will lead to more effective and more common uh, controls on commercial technology in the high tech sector and takes into account the sensitivities of each country such as Korea's dependence on China. So it's only a hope right now, but we're really right at, tomorrow will be the same as the end of the Cold War uh, in terms of its impact for export controls because it will be announcing a whole new use and purpose for export controls to achieve strategic objectives. So we're really today, tomorrow, right at the beginning of a whole new way of thinking about tech transfer. And your question is going to be the debate for a very long time. Thank you, Minister Yu. Um, thank you. Um, actually, um, I'm out of practice as trade minister for uh, the last uh, one year and three months, so I'm not privy to any government information, and especially in terms of um, export controls. And in that area, a lot of things happened for last one year and three months. Um, um, so I might not um, no I um, have an updated information on that area, but. As a trade expert, you know, I'd like to just emphasize two principles uh, in regard to export controls. You know. First, you know, I understand the, the, the US rationale uh, behind the strategic rationales behind um, trade um, 
and export controls. But uh, first, no, no, those um, policies and restrictions, they should be clearly defined and well thought out and smartly designed so that those attempts to reshape supply chains, uh, they should not actually um, negatively affect supply chains. They could create another supply chain shocks, especially in this high inflation environment. Um, you mentioned tomorrow would be another cold war. In to, export controls. In export control, you know, in this you know, almost like a global recession period in high inflation uh, environment. Well, um, and second, what I'd like to emphasize that even if it is well designed, clearly thought out, you know, carefully um, planned, it's, it's still important to have sufficient consultation with um, businesses and give sufficient time and space for the businesses to adjust to this changing uh, environment because there are always unintended consequences. You never you know you can never you know expect all the you know details that can actually happen on the ground because you now those policymakers at the desk they can never imagine all the scenarios that would be happening on the ground. So hope mm -hmm. that you know those policies and restrictions can <coughs> overshadow uh, all the innovations and commercial interests of the uh, businesses. So hope that. Um, you could you know, provide a sufficient uh, time and space to the businesses. And in that regard, I would like to also hear your view because you, know, Matt, you just mentioned that U.S. should join uh, CPTPP, so it seems that you support uh, free trade and might have different views from uh, Kevin. So uh, I have a couple of more points to make on IRA and other issues, so, but after I finish my uh, talking points, I would like to hear your view on the Cold War on export control. Uh, so, and I just want to make a couple of more points on the IRA. You know, I don't want to spend too much time on the IRA, but just now I would like to just make three points on the IRA. First, um, no, you just introduced my, and uh, uh, not, you just introduced me as someone like, I, I went to law school here in the US so as, uh, as a lawyer by training here in the US. First, you know, it violates international trade rules. Uh, WTO as well as a Korea USFTA, and second, the tax EB tax credit. Um, it hurts Korea US bilateral cooperation, especially uh, when uh, we were making significant progress in high technology supply chains and alliance, and also uh, making our companies who are making. A uh, huge investment, but more broadly speaking, my third point is that U.S. has recently launched a couple of uh, a series of plurilateral and multilateral initiatives. As I mentioned before, supply chain pillar in the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework and uh, Chief Bull, as well as uh, mineral supply partnerships. And all those process, they are actually building resilient supply chains. They are time consuming, costly process. They cannot be done overnight. That requires ongoing cooperation from partners. And to actually get those cooperation from partners, the key is trust. And you just mentioned, you know, how can we overcome any possible retaliation from, uh, for example, China, if we join, for example, Chief for other technology um, alliance, if we don't have trust among the partners in technology alliance, how can we even take the risk of joining the uh, alliance? So the key is key in any supply chain alliance or any technology alliance is trust. So the first step to uh, have to make this um, alliance successful is to 
postal and bridge trust. So in that regard, uh, this, uh, uh, this measure uh, to address this measure in a mutually satisfactory manner is very important uh, first step uh, to build a better system in this very uh, turbulent, uh, um, turbulent world, uh, navigating this turbulent water. Uh, that's uh, what I'd like to uh, highlight, a uh, more broader context of uh, this uh, uh, IRA. Um, well, um, I think, you know, I might have to um, turn this floor over to uh, Matthew to hear uh, your view on the, um, the Kevin's point of the um, export control and national security. But just now I'd like to emphasize again, uh, whatever uh, the, uh, the tomorrow's uh, major uh, U.S. Uh, would um, announce, uh, I'd just like to uh, emphasize that we understand that the world is changing and efficiency is uh, uh, one um, part of the, uh, our uh, thought, but another part of um, uh, um, our thought is resilience is important part. So uh, we will work together uh, with the U.S. Uh, however, at the same time, it's important to have a close consultation with partner countries as well as uh, their businesses. I will stop here and uh, perhaps listen to your views on that issue as well. Yeah, yeah we're going to come to Matt and then we're going to come to Dr. Mm -hmm. An So <clears throat> I wanted to make a comment about mm -hmm. each of the presen other presenters' uh, remarks, but, but the one I was going to make about Minister Hughes is actually on the point that she just reiterated, which is about efficiency versus resilience. Mm -hmm. um, remember that you know global supply chains were created because of efficiency, because they reduced cost. Mm -hmm. And so if we're going to reverse that in any way, for whatever reason, whatever you think about it, whatever, however it happens, it's probably going to raise cost, right? Not just a transitional cost that takes time to adjust to, but just fundamentally, it's going to be more expensive uh, to, uh, you know, to produce and trade things. Um, around the world um, if we move to shorter supply chains or reshored production or um, uh, or other steps to to increase resilience or, or put you know export controls more export controls on trade that's going to affect cost okay yep. I say that as a just a clinical statement not as an opinion um, as an economist you know it's going to be more expensive so we have to accept that and I think kind of evaluate and, and measure that because we don't do that very often um, um, and so I think that's an important challenge for all of us to, to strive, and we're kind of struggling with that a little bit at CSS, is how do we estimate you know, this cost, and at what point is the cost more than the benefit of what we're doing? And that's, again, not expressing an opinion. I'm just saying I think we need to think about that. Uh, to use a, a, a personal metaphor uh, that is true to my life right now, uh, my son just got his driver's license, and so risks in our family, <laughs> risks in our family have risen. Um, and so I know I have to pay more insurance uh, against that risk, okay? But I don't have an inexhaustible appetite for more insurance premiums. If, it, if my insurance premiums double, I'm taking the car keys back from my son and he's not gonna drive my car, okay? So I make that point just to say, I definitely think risks in the world have increased and we do need to shift towards more resilience than efficiency right now, and I do think we need export controls. I'm not, I think what Kevin says is all, I have no problem with that in terms of its analysis or you know, the implied um, uh, um, in, uh, policy sort of direction that he's suggesting. I, I think that's, that's all necessary, but I think we need to think about you know, also kind of what the the cost benefit of all this is. So I'm sort of endorsing your point. There is, there is a price to this that we have to acknowledge and, and estimate. On, on Kevin's original um, presentation or in, in his follow-up point, I, I, I think it's really important to emphasize how really radical Jake Sullivan's speech was. I mean, it was a Absolutely. very important speech and it was kind of underreported. Yeah. I think there wasn't enough attention to it. It really was a major departure um, in the ways that Kevin described and, you know, the description of you know, trying to previously keep 
a, a generation or two ahead of, of, of our adversary. I mean, we, this is what we did in the Soviet Union, but it was easy because we could easily stay several generations ahead of the Soviet Union because they weren't good at much <laughs> economically. Um, and uh, with China, it's much more challenging. And he's basically saying we're not going to do that anymore, at least on some things. We're just going to deny them or degrade you know, their capability to do things. That's really radical. And mm. if you didn't notice that, you need to you know, read that speech because it's really important. Um, and uh, so it's huge. And I think what's coming tomorrow, even though I haven't seen it and don't know the details, I'm guessing, is, as Kevin says, is going to be a, a very mm. uh, powerful and, and important um, uh, action and, and announcement is going to have big implications. I, I do think, as Kevin said, you know, we this is a unilateral U.S. action. I don't think it's going to be repeated immediately, at least in Correct. any other capital, whether Seoul or Tokyo or, or Brussels or anywhere else. But And that does, to your question, mean I don't think we yet have an aligned view of national security or economic security. I think we all kind of know what national security is in its in its essential sense, but if you frame that as economic security, I think we don't have an aligned view on that. Um, and maybe never will because there's some, you know, real differences. I mean, one of my reasons I don't agree with everybody else about economic security is not really related to these issues, but because I think there's a whole positive agenda of stuff that we need to do to make ourselves secure. I mean, the people who, the 44 allies that got together in Bretton Woods in 1944, they were concerned about economic security because of the pre-war experience of people doing, you know, predatory currency devaluations and, and trade restrictions. And they said, never again, we're actually going to establish a positive set of institutions and rules that will prevent that kind of thing. So I think economic security, in my definition, includes also all the work we have to do to uh, uphold and update uh, the rules of the, the international system. But that's my quirky sort of. <laughs> in a way, semantic argument about economic security. On this other side, though, there are clearly, you know, differences of, at least not, probably not philosophy or kind of we know the problem when we see it, but, but in terms of approach and how we should deal with, with challenges, I think there are differences and we need to, we need to recognize them and, and sort of work to um, find either an aligned position or at least um, a way to manage our differences of approach that, that doesn't cause more problems or cost. Um, so that's that's a sort of broad answer to that. Um, on Dr. Ahn, um, just to say, and I mean, it relates also to Minister Yu's comments about the IRA and the EV. I mean, I'm pretty confident based on, uh, you know, experience. I was not in the room when the IRA was being, was being <laughs> finalized. But I'm pretty confident that the thing that Hyundai is worried about um, was not an intended action to, you know, exclude Hyundai from the market. I think it was an unintended consequence of trying to get a complicated piece of legislation to get to 50 votes or 51 votes or whatever. I mean, it was a last minute deal where there wasn't attention to every, or last minute deal that wasn't, there wasn't attention to every detail of this. So I'm pretty sure it was a mistake, not a, not a, um, not a deliberate um, effort. I'm not sure all my Korean friends believe that, but I, I personally think that's, that's, it's clear to me. Um, that that was, it was unintended. Um, uh, if I fault anyone, I think Korea didn't do a good enough job of lobbying at the last minute um, <laughs> to make sure that the, the, the bill didn't include that, that unintended consequence. Um, but I'm not defending it. I'm just saying I think, I, I wouldn't exaggerate what the intention of this was. Um, but the effect is there, and, and that's clearly, that is an issue. And as I say, it's not surprising, as I said, because I, I think there is this tension between the desire to really strengthen our domestic economy and competitiveness and manufacturing and jobs on the one hand, and our desire to give opportunities that come with partnership with, with our allies and partners. And, and this was, I didn't predict this particular <laughs> tension, but, but it's not surprising given the Biden um, approach and the tensions there. Um, just on, on the CHIPS 4 stuff and are, is Korea going to be brutality against, I mean, I guess maybe, but um, but I guess you love Philadelphia, and a famous <laughs> Philadelphian uh, once said, we must all hang together, or most assuredly, we will all hang separately. Um, ben Franklin said that about, you know, when we were taking on the British um, in the Revolutionary War, and I think, you know, the fact is, you're going to be retaliated against by China one way or the other, whether you join with us or not, so it's mm -hmm. probably better to, to, to join, join us in, in taking on the real challenges. I mean, there are things, you have stakes 
in your relationship. Korea does with, with China, obviously, understandably, but I think on things that are clearly a threat to your national security or to your, your economic competitiveness, you know, I think um, it's a choice that's difficult, but you got to make. And, you know, you've dealt with retaliation from China before, um, and, um, and I think um, it's going to happen again, sure, but, but you got to balance your, you know, what you're worried about. Um, and I just want to finally clarify on CPTPP. I did not say either that the U.S. will join CPTPP. I didn't use the word will or CPTPP, meaning um, yes. I, I, don't, I, I, don't think, yes. I don't think the end point actually is going to be called CPTPP. I, I do think eventually the United States, because of a sort of gravitational force of our clear, compelling national interest, will eventually be part of a... I'll use my words again, comprehensive, comma, high standard, high standard. regional <laughs> trade agreement that is approved by legislatures. I think we will be, just don't ask me when. <laughs> um, Larry Summers was a boss and he said, Matt, if you want to be a good um, economic forecaster, pick a number or a date, but not both. So, <laughs> so my number is 95% confidence in what I just said, <laughs> when, but I'm not going to say when. Um, and uh, so I think actually the pathway probably runs through USMCA, Chorus and the U.S.-Japan trade agreement being somehow combined and the U.S. then building out from there. But it's not going to happen this year. Mm. Great. Okay, well, you know, Mr. Goodman, I was so glad that you mentioned anyway the, the CPTPP, maybe going back the original, you know, Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. I hope the U.S. come back as soon as possible so that the U set the global uh, most upgraded you know, standard, and uh, so that maybe in the long run we should tame China into that orbit of the you know free trade rules. Uh, let me also make the one, one just short point. Uh, Korean investment here contributed the most, okay, number one country in the whole world, according to a Wall Street Journal report. We contributed about 350,000 new you know new jobs in the in the U.S. Okay. I want to remind you know, that fact that Korea's great contribution to the U.S. economy. And uh, you know, I think, Kevin, you really uh, brought up the most important issue I've been thinking of. It is increasingly blurry to distinguish between a tradable belongs to security item or commercial item. Okay? Because Korea, you know, our leading export involves all the semiconductor biotech and the electric battery, so on and so on. So depending upon how you define, you know, the nature of this product in terms of the technology level, maybe if you say, hey, this is a security related item, so you, you know, US can immediately apply some trade sanctions, you know, so on, kind of the prohibition of the free flow. So in that regard, I think the US, Korea, maybe like-minded countries uh, need to agree on the definition of you know, security the, the tradables. Okay. Perhaps uh, in the you know, CHIP4 Act, while we discuss you know, details on chips. Otherwise, uh, Korea would be you know, the, the badly impacted uh, uh, by the definition of the security items. On this score, I think this US and Korea really need to assess and share the information at what level China's technology stands at this point. You know, I'm not sure the, the level of technology you know, in China, for example, Samsung Electronics would like to upgrade its facility, uh, the semiconductor factory in Xi'an and uh, SK also in Wuxi, right? And uh, we know that maybe up to the 13 nano level, we can upgrade the facility, but depending upon how you define the you know, security sensitivity, maybe Korea would be very much limited. Uh, so, it will be 18 nanometers for DRAM and, yeah, and yeah. 128 layers. So, so I think that I really would like to urge U.S. to consult with the Korea and other you know, like-minded countries uh, in terms of how you define the uh, uh, security de definition. And furthermore, you know, I would like to see that U.S. and Korea can share the information, you know, the technology standards, where they're working, which direction they are going, uh, especially with regard to China, okay? Yeah. On this score, I mean, Korea is ready to follow the, the agreed upon the 
you know, guardrails, okay, you, you, you place. Otherwise, Korea should be free from, you know, trading all those items with the rest of the world. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you. So now we have about 10 minutes, um, so I'm going to open the floor for the Q&A questions. Uh, thank, thank you, you Madam uh, Producer. I'm Michael Che Kim, and I'm wondering how should um, the Republic of Korea use its unique economic diplomacy? Because as far as I know, the ROK is the only country with an FTA with both the PRC and the United States. And even though it's not a member of CPTPP, it is a member of RCEP and also the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. So. I think from an American point of view, it could give pause because on the one hand, it's like, wow, Korea is kind of close to PRC and PRC is horrible with intellectual property and their businesses don't follow our businesses in terms of human rights, so that might put us at a disadvantage. On the other hand, perhaps we could partner with Korea as they have a voice and a stake in those organizations while Washington does not. Thank you. No, go ahead. Well, the, it's, it's fascinating because um, in my career in government and before that, any time a free trade agreement or a trade policy came up, I would always say, that has nothing to do with what I do for a living, go away. Mm -hmm. And uh, the rules and the policy and the people and everything for export controls was always just on the national security front and it never had anything to do with trade agreements or trade. If something warranted control because it was of relevance to producing a weapon, we regulated it regardless of the economic impact. And now we're in this completely uncharted territory of taking into account economic implications um, as a national security imperative. So um, I would still keep the two separate. I would still keep the national security from pure trade policy because it's not just about money. What I would, my, my counsel in these situations is to first start with the problem to be solved and then work backwards. And the problem to be solved is responding to China's use of commercial technology to modernize its military, which includes, and I think Jake Sullivan is correct, uh, uh, advanced uh, computing capability, high performance computing, advanced node semiconductors. Start with uh, its use of commercial technologies to engage in human rights abuses, such as mass surveillance and DNA tracking and facial recognition and the surveillance state and the issues with the Uyghur. Uyghurs. Uh, start with its stated objectives to achieve strategic economic dominance uh, in commercial sectors uh, uh, outside of normal economic rules um, to uh, disadvantage Korea, Japan, the United States, and other uh, Western allies, and then work backwards And what are the types of items that are the key choke point inputs for making each of those uh, objectives capable. And, and, then, and that's how you define a common alignment of a new national security definition. And so it doesn't mean embargo. Neither I nor Jake Sullivan nor really even the Trump administration, except for a few people, was calling for complete decoupling from China generally. So for example, in my space, in, in my topic to answer your question, I would go through and identify what the most advanced node, semiconductors, AI, quantum, artificial intelligence, uh, high performance computing applications are for each one of those applications and identify that. And in a way, it actually takes the pressure off of production of the mature nodes, the older node technologies, frankly, where most of the money is. And, and that's the way, that's the way you address both the national security objective and not decouple and sort of, and split things down the middle, more or less. Um, uh, uh, but it requires an enormous amount of, of, of information because in my day, knowing the significance of a landing gear, you could keep it in your head. The difference between a 14 nanometer logic and a 28 nanometer logic device, it's just a few nanometers, but it's enormous in terms of implications and where you draw those lines. And going uh, to your point earlier, uh, it requires a massive amount of input from industry. Uh, the supply chains are far more complex, the technology is far more complex, the economic implications are far more complex, the potential retaliation from China are far more complex, the economic impacts for the allies are far more complex. Unfortunately, given the need to move and to move fast and to move quickly, and unfortunately a, a rather toxic political environment where China, all you have to do is say something halfway reasonable about China and you ultimately get, you get accused of being a Chinese communist spy, it makes for difficult discussions. And also, frankly, companies, their focus is on making money. And they don't see the national security imperatives that I'm just describing. So the US government officials are frankly in a very difficult circumstance. 
Um, but anyway, so if, if I were in charge to answer your question, that's how I would focus the issue. Sure. Um, actually, I was talking with Kevin, actually asking some questions uh, to him when you asked um, questions. So I might have missed the first part of your question, but as someone who participated in Korea USFTA, as well as the implementation stage of Korea China FTA, you know, I think, you know, I, I feel obliged to ask your, answer your question. So, well, you know, as actually um, Dr. Moon mentioned, Korea is a open trading nation. Now that's how we achieved our economic growth. You know, became um, seventh largest exporting country and tenth largest um, economy, um, tenth largest trading nation uh, through our um, open trading um, uh, system. Uh, so in that regard, FTA, um, you know, he's basically um, explained this thing through the. Uh, lens or prism of national security or export control. But what basically FTA does is to eliminate tariffs. Now, in terms of tariff lines, there are 10,000 tariff lines. And what FTA does is to eliminate tariffs in regard to those 10,000 items. And in those in our FTAs with the US as well as with China, we eliminate those uh, tariffs you know, from 10% to 0% to make our trade facilitated to trade more free. That's what we did. It's, it doesn't have to do a lot with all those national security reasons to make our trade trade free and open between the two countries. So you don't need to look at everything from um, national security prism or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I might want to give him the mic. PRC. Thank you. Korea has an FTA with the PRC. Korea is also in the RCEP, mm -hmm. which is also a preferential trade agreement. Mm -hmm. So you know, countries that are not members of these agreements don't get that treatment. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, you know, Korea is saying, you know, and you know, it, 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 um, I think naturally when one looks at the trading relationship with, China, with PRC, it's, a, it's, it's the biggest trading partner. So from an American point of view, it's just like, okay, since uh, South Korea is doing most of its trading with the PRC, are there risks there for me if I'm involved in a global supply chain with South Korea? Um, probably not, because we also have the US FTA. That's, that's what I'm wondering. And it's not just, in terms of multilateralism in general, you know, the AIIB, um, I know, you know uh, the Obama administration was not a big fan of that, um, and also the uh, er, and RCEP. So it's just like, I see Korea has this unique spot, and how should we see that? How should we see the fact that no other country in the world at least no other country in Asia has FTA with the PRC and with the United States. Thank you for the comment. Um, so actually, what we are running out of the time, and I know that uh, Matt Goodman has to uh, leave mm -hmm. soon, so if you don't mind, so I'd like to make a final quick comment um, before we wrap up, and, and then I will give just one minute to Minister Yu and, and Dr. An <laughs> to I wrap up our session. <laughs> no, I yield okay. my time. No, I have nothing to add. I think, I think this is all really interesting discussion. I have nothing to add either. It's okay. I think we have also a question from the floor as well. So. Okay, so yeah. question. If you could identify yourself and then make your question really brief and simple, yes. that would be great. Yes. Uh, so my name is Alice Zhang. I am a doctorate student uh, for international affairs at SAIS. Uh, thank you for this panel discussion. My thesis is actually on uh, U.S. Uh, uh, government partnership with uh, the private sector uh, in the environment of global uh, competition. And so my question is actually, uh, to all of you, but this is addressing uh, what Mr. Wolf mentioned earlier about the uh, Biden's uh, administration's new strategy on freezing Chinese uh, technology development. Uh, the question is, do you think it is possible to do it in today's time? And my, uh, is it also possible for the United States and China to build a 
uh, competitive partnership, what Professor Graham Allison would call. Um, is there any possibilities for, for those? Um, it will succeed. And so I've been doing export controls for 30 years. And I've, <laughs> I've seen this story before, where there's a new issue, a new policy issue. And the common theme is always that unilateral US-only controls for which there's a reason to do it in the satellite space or in the machine tool space historically, there's lots of other examples, have always been effective and feel good in the short term. But unless and until the allies in the United States work together and have the same controls and do it together, it will become both ineffective, meaning China or whoever the adversary is gets the same content from other countries, and it will be counterproductive because companies will design out U.S. content and U.S. companies will offshore. Uh, so it will only succeed if we can have a common theme and understanding with our allies, which I still believe is possible. And, I, and the Biden administration has been focused on multilateralism, notwithstanding this unilateral action tomorrow. And to your second question, no. So. <laughs> no, he's, I was hoping for that okay. answer. That's good. Okay. <laughs> Minister, you any final comment? So because you have to leave, we have to make a final comment. <laughs> <laughs> and Dr. Ahn, do you have any final comment? No. <clears throat> well, you know, this is really an intriguing question after seeing the enactment of the Inflation Reduction Act. You know, in modern times of very complex and interdependent, you know, supply chain structure, the notion of a sovereign capability through protectionism can work? I don't think so. Many critics saying that any attempt to achieve will end up a cheap ambition. You know, that's the sort of notion I want to share with uh, my, my colleagues here. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, so I, I'd like to just echo um, what our distinguished speakers said, and especially the role of the private sector. And I hope that if we can find any tool um, to get private sector more actively involved, actually from the planning stage, I think that is very important. You mentioned high inflation, and then you know this this if we are talking about tech transfer, etc. So. Um, so um, I hope that uh, we can get into that, and um, I hope that we can have another time to discuss all of these topics. And thank you so thank much you. for everyone for and coming to um, this session, and thank you again for our distinguished speakers and East Asia Foundation. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.